Singapore with Sam Cedar. We are every day's casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual Thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, March 15th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Heather Parton, or as you may know her, Digby. It's Casual Friday, folks. We're going to look back on the week that was, probably also just the last 24 hours. Then later in the program... We will be joined by Matthew Film Guy, who will ostensibly give us a film to watch over the weekend. Meanwhile, 49 dead in New Zealand as a white supremacist attacks a mosque, obviously killing uh, children along with men and women who were attending that mosque. The killer remains alive to ostensibly uh, have his opportunity to explain why he was justified in his killing, in his mind. Meanwhile, new report, the Arctic is warming at a uh, devastating pace and it is locked in. Virtually, in practicality, no way to stop it. We would have to take extreme measures. Well, let me rephrase that. The only way to stop it would be extreme measures. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court in Connecticut, Connecticut State Supreme Court, okays a lawsuit against the Sandy Hook gun makers. And the Senate rejects Trump's emergency declaration. Steve Mnuchin says he'll protect Trump's tax returns despite the statutory power of Congress to see them. North Korea threatens to suspend talks with the U.S. And in a lead up to the Supreme Court case, Wilbur Ross lies about the census questions. And while a federal judge is soon to decide if Republicans can restrict Medicaid to people with jobs only. Beto O'Rourke's anti-ACA Social Security record on the table now. That was quick. Boo, Beto, boo. Does Trump have a uh, Chinese scandal as well? (laughs) See, I'm not racist. And lastly, AFL-CIO gives their Human Rights Award to Lula da Silva. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, just a horrible uh, shooting in, um, in, uh, in, in New Zealand. And um, 49 dead in Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, gunman live streamed himself taking his guns out of his car walking into uh, just walking up the driveway and uh then begins to shoot everyone uh around him uh he is arrested he's a man in his late 20s uh and i believe he's an australian actually um not sure why he went to new zealand maybe he lived in new zealand i'm not quite uh, clear Uh, The guy has uh, gone on to say, you know, that he's been inspired by folks like Candace Owens. Who knows if that's the case uh, or not, but that's what he claims. He has a uh, manifesto uh, which claims that uh, New Zealand is for uh, people of European descent. Um, 
we will uh, dig into this a little bit uh, later. But you know what what uh, what is there to say? There is going to be a lot of um, claims, of course, and we'll play some of these. That uh, this guy's it's really not a political thing. He's just crazy. Um, now I want to make it clear. Obviously, all white people aren't like this. Um, and, uh, which is exactly, you know, what, uh, w we would need to hear is from, you know, white leaders now coming up and preaching moderation in this instance. And you just don't hear any noises. You just don't hear any noises from the white leaders saying, Hey, we need to get this under control. These are bad ideas. Right. Um, he said he admired Donald Trump. You don't hear any noises from the Trump administration saying we condemn these ideas. Right. You know, this is the, uh, but, uh, so, uh, uh, not sure what there is, uh, much to say beyond that. Um, the, but, uh, we will talk more about that as the program goes on. Meanwhile, uh, as you know, uh, yesterday, uh, Beto announced, that uh, he was uh, jumping in the race uh, with the speech. Did you guys play that video yesterday? Uh, the announcement video? Yeah. No, we played the CNN like word fragment West Wing. The rousing. Yeah, it wasn't tremendously uh, dynamic. Um, the that video, and of course, the reason why he's gaining this much attention is because on day one, he has the second biggest network uh, fundraising network of any of the people in the race. Second, obviously, to Bernie. Sanders um, fundraising network, at least in terms of, you know, what we established with grassroots. And he's got some um, pretty uh, strong grassroots campaigners. Um, unfortunately for him, I think, or maybe fortunately for him, depending on who the Democratic electorate is, um, he's, his policies in the past have tracked to the right of almost everyone in the race. Um, and uh, I would say probably definitively, you know, in terms of stated positions and votes, I don't think there is a more conservative candidate in the Democratic race. The question is, is how much will he um, how much will he be able to sort of deflect from his record and his uh, voting record? And so we'll talk more about that, uh, I think, with Digby. Uh, but here this was fascinating. Um, and this was this morning. There is, uh, after the interview with uh, Joe Scarborough a couple of days ago, where um, Hickenlooper from, from Colorado refused to say uh, that he was a capitalist, which was just an absolutely bizarre uh, situation. Um, and I think indicative of what, the candidates in the race must be aware of, particularly a guy like Hickenlooper, um, is that the Democratic Party, the the primary voters, are have moved to the left. And if you want to, at the very least, be part of the conversation, you need to project that to the rest of the, the party, uh, which is you know the problem that Beto is going to have. However, this has set off alarm bells for a lot of people. Uh, across the board, not just on the Joe Scarborough show, but I would imagine in the Democratic Party, but certainly a guy like Donnie Deutsch, uh, who is, uh, <laughs> was having his own little freak out, and this is a fascinating exchange, too. This is, um, this is Joe Scarborough and Donnie Deutsch. Donnie Deutsch uh, just bemoaning the fact that, and these terms are thrown around, capitalists, uh, socialists, I mean, uh, they in the context of our politics, they don't really mean that much in terms of like when we talk about all the candidates who are running in this race and to the extent that we talk about uh, anything that is uh, actual practical politics within the U.S., these two uh, terms don't mean that much, frankly. But here, here are these two. <clears throat> Joe, I'm going to take it one step further because this is how dangerous socialism. I, I find Donald Trump reprehensible as a human being, but a socialist candidate is more dangerous to this company, country as far as the strength and well-being. Pause it for one second. First off, and we should go back. 
we live in a country, not a company. Um, uh, I should just remind that. There. Yeah, indeed. Um, but there is no socialist candidate who is running in our election. Maybe there might, I, someone from the Socialist Party might be running. I don't know if they're going to get on the, the ballot anywhere. Uh, but, I mean, Bernie Sand Sanders, I think, for uh, the vast majority of his career, identified as a socialist. But in, in terms of like what he is running on, uh, and in terms of the way that he's identifying himself today, um, he is not proposing a socialist country, I think, in the way that Donnie Deutsch uh, wants to make it out to be. Uh, maybe he is, uh, because uh, Donnie Deutsch, I think, has a very sort of wide range of, of, of what he considers socialism. I would say if it's, if it's economic decisions are made democratically and not by capitalists, Donnie Deutsch would consider that socialism. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he would. Let's listen. As a human being, but a socialist candidate is more dangerous to this company, country as company. far as the strength and well-being of our country than Donald Trump. I would vote for Donald Trump, a despicable human being. Mm. No, I, you I, won't. I, I, let me tell you Stop something. Stop yourself. Let, let me correct myself. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> you, you, I, no, you, you will you never will. vote I, I for will, a bigot, I, a guy I, that's you, made bigoted correct. statements I, I for guess. the past three Joe, years. Thank you, for, thank you for correcting me. I stand corrected that. I will be so distraught <laughs> to the point that that could even come out of my mouth if we have a socialist at the top, because that will take our country so down. And we are not, yeah. we are not Denmark. I love Denmark. You know, that's not who we are. And if you love who we are and all the great things that still have to have binders put on the side, please step away from the binders. socialism. Stop. And let me correct myself. Yeah. I will never vote for Donald Trump. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, fools rush in, Donnie. Videotape is forever. <laughs> Here's my Write chin. That down. Here's my and chin by, right there. And by there. the way. <laughs> yeah. That's Howard that Schultz. That was just so, so uh, That's bizarre. Howard Schultz. But I mean, th this is, I mean, it, it does raise this question. Now, so, you know, I... I Presumably, Donnie Deutsch is talking about Bernie Sanders, right? I mean, who else would he be talking about? Yeah, and, and he's, the idea. He's let about me just finish what I'm saying. Um, and the idea that uh, Donnie Deutsch is threatening to vote for Donald Trump until he's, you know, told by his television guy, like, "Look, we're not going to go there uh, in the context of this." This is, yeah, right. The, we, we've got to make a marketing decision here. This is, um, this is, you know, the argument that needs to happen now. Like there needs to be just like there was a, 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 a requirement for more or less pledges across the board. Now is the time to make these pledges. Will you support the Democratic nominee? Because to the extent that people talk about Bernie Sanders supporters um, uh, abandoning uh, Clinton in the um, uh, in the general election. The numbers are in, was it uh, Stokes uh, in the Washington Post, has shown we're talking about 12 percent of Bernie Sanders uh, supporters from the primary voted for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, more, uh, almost double, depending on which study you look at, uh, Hillary Clinton's in 2008. Somebody uh, sent a, you know, uh, tweeted at me. Do you think it's possible that, um, you know, 9% of uh, Barack Obama supporters in 2008 voted for John McCain? Yes, uh, there was a big push, and maybe this makes up for some of, of Hillary Clinton's votes as well. There was a big push in 2008 by Rush Limbaugh called Operation Chaos, and literally, and it was for Republicans Freedom. to cross over in, uh, in these elections— in the primary elections where uh, you did not have to declare your party. And I'm, I'm quite convinced that at least, uh, you know, half of those, maybe, maybe a third of those Obama voters went and voted for John McCain because they were actual Republicans. But also, you got to remember, John McCain uh, was, and this might, this might also contribute to why you had so many uh, Clinton voters who voted for John McCain. John McCain was considered by a lot of Democrats to be much more reasonable, I think, than Donald Trump was. And uh, but nevertheless, the numbers don't lie. But the question is here is how many of Donnie Deutsch Democrats are going to vote for Donald Trump or are going to basically vote for some third party, their version of uh, of a, a Green Party candidate? 
to avoid voting for the Democratic nominee if it's Bernie Sanders. And these people need to be held to account in the same way that we would hold any um, of the people who in 2016 would have gone and voted for uh, someone other than uh, Hillary Clinton. And so this is a this is a good um, a moment to look in both into like, you know, how uh, Joe Scarborough wants to brand himself, but also into what could be a, a significant uh, problem unless it's addressed early. And also, I would just add to that. Um, Jamal Bowie has a tweet out because there's this new, you know, of course, totally delusional piece in New York Magazine, and the and the spin from the Howard Schultz team is, the backlash must mean we're on to something, and you know, of course, it's and all the quotes are obviously either from just enabling friends or the same advisors who want to make a run on this guy, but Jamal Bowie's quote is basically I forget I'm paraphrasing, but something effective. I'm increasingly convinced that his that he just wants to get the president reelected, and I think that I agree. That Howard uh, Schultz does. Yes. And I, because I think there's degrees of it. I think you're right. I think Donnie Deutsch is saying Bernie Sanders. And obviously, the piece where the Wall Street guys said they named it, they said Sanders or Warren. Right. But I think in a, in a, in a Schultz case and with some of these other guys, they are such babies that they're living enough that, you know, a Booker or a Harris is even migrating with where the rest of the party is. And they might want to just spoil the whole thing because they're so bratty, entitled, and delusional. I mean, I, I find that hard to believe, but I also don't find it hard to believe that they are delusional enough to think that they're going to have an, uh, a, you know, they could save the well, country. Well, surely well, Schultz, they think Schultz they're saving delusional. the country if they throw it to Trump. I don't know like, about that. The fact that he, com he he said we're not Denmark when he was trying to explain socialism tells you all you need to know about this guy's ideology. I mean, Denmark is not a socialist country. It's not even the most socialist of the Scandinavian countries, by the way. Like people in Finland think Denmark's like a bunch of free market wage cucks. But like it, this is what That's I That's what the prime minister of Finland said at a recent NATO summit. Ex exactly. But this is what I talk about when I talk about fish hook theory, like the quote unquote center will break for the right if forced to choose between the left and the right. And it doesn't take a real socialist. Um, it could be a social Democrat who just threatens right. their that's exactly, financial interests. That's exactly. And it's not just voting. Um, it's when you talk about people with this much money and power, you know, they, they make donations, they use their outsized platforms and all of that stuff. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, the, but the, I think, you know, to the extent that um, anything can be done about it now, it is to uh, nip this this um, meme in the bud, as it were, right? Like, because Donnie Deutsch is out there saying this. Um, part of it is so that it becomes a talking point as to why you got to vote against Bernie Sanders in the primary, because as if like there's an inevitable back, uh, you know, there's an inevitable chance that people are going to abandon the party because of Bernie Sanders. And it's not inevitable. It's simply the choice that Donnie Deutsch is trying to make. No one's forcing him to do that. So Well, here's a I, hot take. Uh, maybe if he's willing to abandon the party over mild social democratic reforms, the party shouldn't have him. Like, if we want to realign the Democratic Party to be more of a labor party, more of a left formation, um, like, the interests of the bosses conflict with the interests of the workers right and there's some good faith bosses who are welcome to come along yes yeah, so, but and there's some bad how faith does ones. how does the party say we don't want donnie donnie deutsch like the, the party can't kick him out he's just a guy going on there speaking who would be presumably i mean so yes i don't care about donnie deutsch being a member of the democratic party he has no influence on the democratic party he does have an influence with a platform every day on the media where he's arguing that there's going to be a backlash if you nominate. And he's basically arguing the same thing that Howard Schultz is arguing. And the reason why they're arguing this now is not because he's going to what he's going to do in the voting booth. The reason why he's arguing this right now is to uh, is to on the ledger of why you would vote for or against a candidate to put this on the ledger. So that's why at this point there's nobody in the Democratic Party who comes out and says Donnie Deutsch is not a member of the Democratic Party. It doesn't matter. I officially evict you. Yeah, it's it's the the point is is that 
Now is the time. And good for Joe Scarborough. <laughs> He, he did exactly what should be done in that instance, and I'm surprised because he's a Republican. All right, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, Digby will be joining us. We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Uber blog Hullabaloo, the uh, subject of this little ditty. Oh, oh and here we go. What? This little ditty. We, um, <laughs> Digby, there we go. I thought that was going somewhere else. I think, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to me this week. It's been a little bit rough with me and music. Hello, Digby. Welcome to the program. Hi, Hi Sam. How are you? Um, oh, I guess I see what's going on there. Someone just sent me a, an exchange between, uh, Casey Hunt. And I want to talk obviously about, um, 
you know, maybe we could touch a little bit about New Zealand. Like, I, I, you know, I don't know what there is to say about these type of attacks. I mean, we have an environment uh, in, um, in in the U.S. And obviously, you know, when a guy, uh, you know, with the Internet and a guy is citing Candace Owens, you know, whether we don't know in what context he's he's citing her as some type of um, uh, inspiration. Uh, but obviously, American culture impacts this guy, this Australian in New Zealand, when he goes in to shoot up um, this mosque. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a president who, and, and, and frankly, I mean, you know, the research says that uh, the presidency of Barack Obama, you know, ignited some of the, uh, the um, feelings of, of racist, frankly, and that uh, Trump has um, fanned those flames. Uh, I mean, wh- I don't know. I mean, what is there to say at this point? We know the context in which these, you know, lunatics out there who have access to these type of weapons are are bathed in. And, you know, like anything, it seems to me, it's all about increasing percentages of likelihood, right? Like there are people in society who are, who pass a certain threshold of craziness. And when you have, um, when you have a, a context in society, in an environment in society that feeds those people who pass a certain threshold, this is what you get. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt. And it's very, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's coincidental, but it, extremely um, interesting that, the, that this hor- horrific mass murder took place and it's a political murder right i mean it's obvious that this guy was was a uh, you know a frequenter of chan and all these you know far right uh sort of communities online uh where if you his manifesto if you know it's filled with all what they call shit posting right which is just this it's provocative it's designed to to get a rise and it's all very ironic and it kind of speaks in code and that's part of the Candace Owens thing. I mean, evidently, I read this this analysis by uh, Bellingcat, you know, who does sort of follows all this internet stuff, and saying that, that the far right internet stuff. And it's it's um, interesting to me how much that tracks with what we understand to have been the foreign interference in the election and the ongoing sort of propaganda campaign online um, by by the by the Russians. It's this idea of creating chaos, right? This this just making everybody start infighting and, and everything. And that, that was part of apparently what the point of the, the manifesto was, you know, using this sort of ironic trolling uh, to get people upset. And the Candace Owens thing was part of that. But at the same time, you had the president just yesterday being reported to have said that, you know, well, you know, my, my, my people, my military, my cops, and, uh, you know, the, what was it, the... Uh, I've got it right here. This is in Bright, Breitbart. This is in Breitbart, and this is what he said. You know, the left plays a tougher game. It's very funny. I actually think that the people on the right are tougher, but they don't play it tougher, okay? I can tell you I have the support of the police, the support of the military, the support of the bikers for Trump. I have the tough people, but they don't play it tough until they go to a certain point. And then it would be very bad, very bad. But the left plays it cuter and tougher. In other words, he's basically sounding like, God, I can't, you know, I have these people, they're on my side. I can't totally control them because it would be bad if they did bad stuff. I mean, that's basically what he's saying. Well, and it was proved, right? I mean, I think this guy in New Zealand, I mean, he's not even an American, but this is a global movement. And um, and they all seem to really love Trump. I mean, he said it in his that he considered him to be a, a, a what was it a, a an icon or a, an inspiration or something. Um, and he the you know the Trump was actually saying that. Look, you know, I can't control these guys. You know, if you don't do it, what we need, I can't. There's, what can I say? They're going to do what they're going to do. And basically, yesterday in New Zealand, somebody did that. They actually went out and started shooting Muslims. You know, and Trump hasn't been, he's been sort of focusing on the, um, on the Latinos lately, but, you know, he's, he's got a long history of Muslim hating as well. So, you know, that it, it fits in perfectly. And, I mean, this is sort of, uh, to me, when I saw the New Zealand thing, I was up late last night when the, whole, when the story broke. Um, 
I was, you know, that was the first thing that came to my mind. I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, this is the president. He's basically giving a green light to this kind of stuff. And he basically did that. And it's weird that I don't even think that it made much of a ripple where, you know, people talk about normalization. Right. Well, uh, apparently Trump's, you know, fascist impulses are now normal. And he's and everybody just going, well, there he goes again. Well, yeah, people are people are going to take him at his word. And I just think, look, and we've had this here. We had the guy sending out, you know, the bombs to members of the media and members of Congress. I mean, it, the bombs turned out to be duds, but what if they hadn't? They just arrested a guy a couple of weeks ago there in Washington that was in the same kind of community as this guy in New Zealand. So this stuff is happening, and, and I don't know, you know, are we going to take it seriously, or are we just going to act like, oh, gee, you know, another lone wolf? You know? Right. Well, I mean, we know that as far as the um, – uh, homeland security is concerned like these type of ilk of people are considered one of the you know the greatest sort of in domestic um, uh, terror threat uh, that we face and there is really I mean there's been rollback after rollback in terms of dealing with these type of folks um, and I, I don't know I mean I I I don't believe that Donald Trump has the military and has the cops right <laughs> Uh, maybe he has bikers for Trump to the extent that they're um, but it is highly problematic that he's calling for it. And certainly when he makes those claims and sort of divvy stuff up, like, I mean, just it is. To step back and to contemplate the idea that a U.S. president would be arguing that the military's behind him. Yeah. You know, like against whom? Like, you know, like the idea that the cops are behind me. He's not talking about elections. And, you know, it's Trump. And so we don't take him seriously. Right. Like he's a buffoon or. But the idea that the president of the United States would be sort of divvying stuff up like this. Like you say, you and I, I mean, I, I don't know. You and I, you know, are a little bit maybe less concerned about this or, or, or maybe uh, concerns, not the right word don't think that he has a grip on exactly, uh, you know, who supports him in what case. But for folks who are more mentally estranged, let's say, um, that type of thing is a call to arms. Whose side are you going to be well, on? There's a civil war coming. Yeah, exactly. Whose side are you going to be on? And, and, I, and I keep hearing from people who sort of follow this stuff that, you know, this is a very live discussion on sort of right-wing, you know, gun-toting, gun rights kind of places, where they are really believing that there's a civil war coming. I mean, this is becoming, you know, and, and the, the, I'm sp thinking of a specific person that I know who's very tied into that community who says that, you know, it's different than it was before. You know, there's always been this kind of, you know, weekend warrior thing that they all, you know, run around in their camo and do their militia thing. That's always, That's been out there forever in American culture but there's something different now this idea that there's sort of being that, that there's this movement and some of it's crazy you know that you know the QAnon and all that stuff but but there's also this sort of sense among these people that something's brewing they're getting excited and whether or not anything would happen I mean I, I agree with you that I, I sincerely doubt that the military as an institution is going to you know suddenly take up arms on behalf of Donald Trump I mean that's just not not realistic and cops, you know, there are probably some cops who, you know, are big. We know that there are some that are big Trump fans. They run around with wearing the red hats and doing the whole thing. But, but as you know, as a group, I don't know that we could, you know, assume that they're going to take up arms for Donald Trump either. Bikers for Trump, maybe, but you know, whatever. But you know, this idea that 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 there are members of those those institutions that are for Trump. Yeah, there's absolutely that's the truth. I mean, you know, the Oath Keepers, which is a real group. They're, they are made up of, of veterans, military, people in the military, and, and police officers. That's, that's the, the population of the Oath Keepers. And so, you know, this does exist out there. And it's just, you know, it's a little unnerving, the idea that, you know, we're sort of letting, you know, the president just makes, you know, casual fascist remarks. Uh, casually says it to, you know. And then apparently he posted a link to Breitbart, Um last night, which was later taken down, although it's unsure whether or not he meant it to go to that particular quote, but that, you know, he probably meant it to go to the article it was in. Um, and they took down, they took down the, the tweet. Um, but, 
you know, this is very, this is very, very unnerving to me. I mean, I don't know, maybe I, I'm overreacting, you know, because he is a buffoon, and everybody's kind of go, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of this. See, have you noticed this, this, um, uh, you know, sort of theme that's sort of emerging that well, Trump's a really weak president because he doesn't really know what he's doing, so we really needn't fear what he's saying and and all this stuff because he's it's it's just him and he's not that great at, at at fulfilling his fascistic goals or whatever and i'm just that just i think is ridiculous i, I mean he's saying this stuff he's normalizing it i mean maybe he won't accomplish it but they, damn, somebody exactly can. that is i think that is exactly the the most important point is that everybody presumes like oh if Donald Trump doesn't have the military on his side, then we have nothing to worry about. But he is moving the ball along. I mean, this is, you know, I'm already I'm already worried about 2028, frankly, uh, or, or 2024. And uh, regardless of, 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 you know, and I'm I'm presuming that a, a Democratic uh, candidate is going to win the presidency. Um, I, I, you know. At one point, like, you know, the, these people aren't going to go away. The problem is, um, are the people who support and voted for Donald Trump. And then the bigger problem is what, as a society, we now consider the baseline for appropriate behavior from our politicians. And if it starts right. at where Donald Trump leads, right, and we've got to wait until the next person who comes in with Donald Trump's... Um, rhetoric, but maybe not Donald Trump's limited um, uh, brain capacity and um, somebody else who comes in there. And I don't know who it is. And maybe we know their name and maybe we don't. I, I you know, we don't know yet. But there's a lot of people out there, if they're smart, uh, are looking at what Trump has been able to accomplish and they may have the same proclivities and they come in. And next time we're going to be starting at a sort of like a, you know, a basis point that is. Uh, closer to, you know, what is fascism, right? Like this is not a process that um, we can roll up and, and reverse in, you know, a exactly. couple of years or expect it to only have a couple of years of lifespan. Like Donald Trump, in my mind, has always been part of a lineage that included Sarah Palin, that included uh, aspects of the Bush administration. And when we didn't address these things then... When John McCain got a pass for elevating someone like Sarah Palin, when George Bush got a pass from uh, President Obama and Nancy Pelosi, who's bragging about not impeaching people this week, uh, about not impeaching you know, the Bush administration, when they got a pass, they moved the ball forward for Donald Trump. Oh, absolutely. Look, hey, he's just, you know, this is a continuum. I mean, you and I have been watching this for years. The the disintegration of the of the Republican Party and the and the conservative movement generally um into its essence, which we now see, I think, in in the form of Donald Trump. I mean, he's kind of to me, he's like the, you know, the walking id yep. of the conservative movement. Um, and, you know, this is not something he, he didn't spring forth overnight. And in fact, you know, we know this for a fact that, you know, Trump has some ideas in his head that he's had for a very long time. We know that he had trade and, you know, law and order. I mean, he's had certain things that he's kind of fixated on. But, but the, you know, the main, you know, sort of part of his program was lifted directly from talk radio. I mean, Sam Nunberg, who we've all seen run around on, you know, on MSNBC all over the place, and he's kind of a kooky guy. He worked with Roger Stone, and he would go and listen to talk radio, and he would put a report together yep. for Trump. This started in 2012. He put a report together that sort of highlighted what they were talking about. You remember when Trump was on the trail and he was going on about Bo Bergdahl? Yep. You remember that? It was really weird. It was kind of like, what? <laughs> Why do you care about this? But that, that is a perfect example of a, just a discrete issue that, that Nunberg picked up on that was, being all, that was all over the, the talk radio. And the interesting thing about the Bergdahl thing, and I wrote a lot about this at the time, um, was that what Trump was advocating when he was talking about on the campaign trail was summary execution. He felt that Bergdahl should have been shot immediately when they, when they you know, got him when they rescued him from from the the Taliban after he'd been held for you know a long period of time they should have brought him out and immediately shot him and he said this you know back in the day when we were strong bing bong you know when we were strong we would have taken care of him and he used to pantomime 
at, you know, shooting the guy with a with a rifle. Um, so you know, this was these were this was in the in the ether long before Trump came along. He sort of jumped on it and had this sort of unique. Um, you know, spin on it, I guess, as the billion, you know, the blue collar billionaire and how he was going to make everything, you know, he's going to make everybody rich. You know, he had this sort of extra sort of thing and the celebrity that he came with. But there, there's no way that this is that, that you can put this genie back in the bottle. It's been it's been building for a long, long, long time. And I agree with you. I, you know, this isn't going away. And in fact, Trump himself is out there pretty much and in, in, in the comment to, to Breitbart was kind of indicating, hey, you know, I don't get reelected. I I don't know what's going to happen, guys, because my people, you know, my right. people, they're not going to be happy. So, you know, could have a little problem here. Just telling you, you know, just but keep in mind that there could be a little problem. I think that is going to be less of the problem than what comes back four years later or eight years later, frankly. I mean, I you know, I, and, and we should say, you know, we talk about this lineage. I remember Mitt Romney. Coming to New York, kissing Donald Trump's hand in 2012, yep. looking for the imprimatur. Like, you know, this is this did not come out of nowhere. And um, I think it was obviously a surprise that he won the election, uh, but he won by a very small amount. And we had a very specific circumstance, I think, uh, that allowed him. But even if he was to lose by, you know, uh, a, a landslide this time around. Um, there, there's still going to be 40 some out of the percent of the country who are highly amenable to this message. And we have clearly seen that to the extent that there ever was a structure of the Republican Party that would be a firewall for this type of thing, there is no right. firewall. And, right. you know, it is one thing for them to um, to push back on this emergency <laughs> Um, measure, you know, which I don't know that they're going to have the votes to um, to reverse a veto, but um, they it's they have pathetic. they have not stood up to him, and one can only imagine how um, completely useless they would be with a um, a president who uses these tactics but has a modicum of intelligence in dealing. <laughs> with right like i mean it's not like right. donald trump has sophisticated knowledgeable people around him as to the um to the uh to the motive incentive structure of republican legislators beyond beyond the fact that they all support me and my agenda which is you know yeah. uh, more or less uh, racism at this point and misogyny um and uh, anti-immigration uh, fervor et cetera, et cetera. so I mean, it's a it's a it's a pretty dangerous um, situation and people should not be mistaken into thinking that when Donald Trump gets, uh, you know, uh, defeated, if hopefully, uh, but it will be the case, um, if he gets defeated and then Robert Mueller walks up and personally puts handcuffs on him and it makes him do a perp walk uh, to the federal courthouse in Washington on that same day. This is not over by a long shot, right? And the real question is, and let's this is maybe a good segue. It's like, you know, aside from I mean, you know, from it, there are a lot of responses that have to happen within the context of society to this type of what we're we're experiencing in this country. One of them is one of them is gonna be obviously um the Democrats and and you know, the potential for them to win in twenty twenty. Um the field, for the most part now, seems to be, I mean, Joe Biden hasn't made it official yet, has he? But he will, right? Or did he make it official? I don't even know. I mean, it just seems so obvious. I don't think so he obvious. has yet. But it, but it sounds like we've heard the unofficial official announcement. But maybe, you know, who knows? Uh, he's in. I'm right, in. he's in. And, and for the most part, I think we're not waiting for any more major players to jump in. You know, there could be sleeper candidates and this and that, but I mean... There's nobody aside from Joe Biden. There's nobody on the sidelines that everybody's anticipating coming in and anticipating impacting the race on day one. Uh, Beto announced yesterday, I guess it was. And he's um, a big force, despite the fact that he's, you know, is a backbench uh, congressman because he's got the second biggest fundraising apparatus uh, of anybody in the race at this point. He's also got some very strong sort of grassroots organizers uh, that came out of the Bernie campaign. 
Um, I'm thinking of Becky Bond and, and others. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, this guy captured the imagination of the Democratic Party in his run against um, uh, Ted Cruz. Uh, what's your what's your take, Digby? Well, I'm probably more sympathetic to Beto than a lot of other progressives like myself are, and I'll tell you why. But let me first just sort of come out there and say that, you know, my to me, my dream president out of this crew that we have running right now, I mean, I like them all fine. You know, I mean, compared to Donald Trump, any of them would be fine, and I, I wouldn't be, I'm not going to be unhappy particularly. I mean, well, Howard Schultz, of course, is completely out of the question. But, you know, and if Bloomberg were in, I couldn't go there. But hey, even Biden, who I really, you know, is he's not my, my choice. If it happened, I, you know, I could live with it. So, but my, if, if I were to pick my dream president out of this group right now, it would be Elizabeth Warren. She aligns with me on virtually everything, um, you know, politically, but I'm, I'm, I'm not endorsing anybody or, or anything right now. And then that includes Beto or whatever. However, I do understand why Beto has a, an appeal and why on some levels he appeals to me too. And that is because he has a very different approach than most Democrats do to talking about politics. And it's, it, it, it's compelling because he speaks from a sort of value standpoint. Um, he's not a programmatic guy. And, uh, you know, I, I know that for a lot of Democrats that's a real problem because that's what they like to hear. I happen to understand why a lot of people don't like to hear that, that they're much more interested in saying, you know, what do you care about? How do you, you know, who are you fighting for? You know, sort of this, this kind of what, did, what do you see and what do you think America is about? What is it, you know, and he, he's good at that. He has a good – I've heard him give a number of speeches – and I actually followed him back in 2012 when he first ran against he, – he actually defeated a Democrat in a primary, uh, which is how he very unexpectedly won. It was, a, it was an upset. Um, who was Sylvester Reyes, who was a very right-wing uh, Democrat. And he sort of went around knocking on doors in the Hispanic community and basically won, you know, in spite of, you know, all the predictions. So there, he has something, and he has something that I think is, is sort of an inspirational message that can be – you know, Democrats tend to do well when they have candidates who can do that. You know, Obama, Clinton, JFK, you know, even Jimmy Carter back in the 70s had those, uh, you know, this kind of, I'm, you know, I'm speaking to a bigger, you know, a bigger sense of who we are, and Democrats do respond to that. Having said all that, I have no idea, you know, wh- how he's going to do. He has a, a spotty record in the Congress of being probably too conservative for the current Democratic Party um, the, the primary electorate. So whether or not, you know, I mean, let the games begin. That's how I right. look at it. And whoever, whoever can, uh, you know, they've got a long time to prove themselves here. It's an exhausting road ahead of us on this primary. It's probably going to get very unpleasant in many ways. So, you know, but I'm willing to let this unfold and see how these people do. And hopefully, whoever it is will take some of the best from all these people. I mean, they've all got something to offer. And at the end of the day, hopefully, whoever that is will have put together an amalgam of where the Democratic Party is to go forward into the general election and and go up against Donald Trump. I mean, I'm hopeful that it will be a good progressive agenda and, you know, somebody with some, you know, fire in the belly to actually kind of confront all this stuff. And that may be one of the big, Beto's biggest weaknesses, in my view, is the fact that he does not seem to be the kind of person. I mean, that's why I like Elizabeth Warren. You know, she's a fighter. And she's just kind of, no, I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to stand down here. You know, forget it. No, we're, you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to go up against and we're going to fight and win. And I don't see that with him. You know, he's a conciliator. So, you know, they, in that sense i think he may be very much out of step but maybe the democratic electorate doesn't see it that way right. they you know they're going to respond more so anyway i know i sound like a you know a bucket of lukewarm water i think that assessment of of where he's at is 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 super accurate and it really does uh it is going to be interesting to see w- you know what the democratic party is interested in and of course w- we won't even have that full notion either because you have so many candidates Right. Like this is like one of those um, races where strange things could happen because there's so the threshold to winning is going to be lower in some respects. Right. I mean, at least throughout um, three quarters of the race because of how many how many people are in it. Uh, There was a piece that came out today in the um, 
uh, and it's always sort of fascinating, like the day that, you know, this is a piece obviously that was written a week ago <laughs> and with information that was supplied two weeks ago or three weeks ago by somebody else's campaign. We, you know, we don't know whose campaign it would be, uh, but this was in the, um, uh, the Wall Street Journal that um, O'Rourke in the run up to that 2012 campaign where he defeated uh, Sylvester Reyes. Um, he filled out, here it is, uh, in a candidate questionnaire published two days before the 2012 primary, O'Rourke called for raising the Social Security eligibility age, means testing federal entitlements, criticized Reyes for voting party line with other Democrats, uh, asked if he supported the Affordable Care Act. Um, he said in its current form, no. It doesn't do anything for El Paso in terms of the Medicaid reimbursement rate. But he added that he was supportive of all the aims of the law. So, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, it's going to be interesting. And, and I read that Vanity Fair piece and I was like, I so much want to uh, support this guy. But when we got to the section about the politics, it was fascinating. There was no politics there. And... In many respects, it is reminiscent of Obama a little bit, although, you know, the war was a big deal. The fact that he ran, against, you know, that he was able to right. run against the Iraq war, that was a big deal. It's unclear to me what Beto's signature, well, I think it's, you know, it's climate change. It's the border. I, I, I think it's the border. I think that's Beto's big, it's the, it's immigration, I think is his, is his signature. Interesting. And, um, and it, it and. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see if the, there's an appetite for that amongst the, the Democrats. I mean, I, you know, I see a guy like that and I worry that um, in the wrong context, his politics could be I mean, they could widely diverge, it seems to me. Um, you know, I, I feel like Obama entered the race. He was not ideological. Um, he was much more about uh, very similar to Beto. Like, uh, I want to bring people together. But um, he did seem to have some politics. And even people whose politics I don't like as they're articulated in the race, I feel like that's what we're going to get <laughs> on some level. Like, I'm not clear what, what somebody coming in who thinks that they can negotiate with Republicans um, what we're going to get with that person because they're going to find out at one point that they can't, right? Grand bargains. Well, right, right. <laughs> I mean, and which, um, which is really sort of scary. And who knows? Maybe this time the Republican Party will be smart enough to say yes on these grand bargains, but who knows? Um, uh, it, it's it's definitely going to be uh, fascinating to watch this. And then the other thing that I think is fascinating, we played this clip um, before the uh, before we had you on this morning where Donnie Deutsch was on uh, Joe Scarborough saying that he was prepared to vote for Donald Trump over, I guess, presumably uh, get, uh, over Bernie Sanders. Um, and Scarborough literally had to say, don't say that. Stop yourself. And convince Donnie Deutsch on air not to say that for the sake of Donnie Deutsch's career, basically, it seems like in the branding of the show. But I think that's a very real potential dynamic that um, the Donnie Deutsches are going to are going to go the way of Howard Schultz. Um, and or at the very least, they're going to threaten that over the next couple of months as a way of, yeah. you know, sort of scaring people away from Bernie. I mean, do you think at the end of the day, wh where do you think at the end of the day these people would go? I, you know, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I have to assume, Donnie Deutsch, you know, I mean, I think he's kind of a blowhard anyway. But, well, yes. you know, the, 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 this is even beyond what I would expect from him. Obviously, what he's trying to do is position you know, himself as being sort of the, the, the guy, the practical, kind of centrist, uh, regular Democrat, and trying to warn people, you know, hey, you, you, you nominate Sanders, and I assume Warren's in that too. She doesn't call herself a socialist, but I'm sure. But all the Wall Street people are having right. a fit over her. They're absolutely doing, you know, exploding over what she, over the her proposals, her highly detailed proposals that are going to uh, affect their business. Um, 
they're all saying that. You know, they're saying, hey, you know, you vote for one of these, and I don't know, maybe I'm going to have to give some money to Trump. Maybe I'm going to have to vote for him. And it's basically just a threat. And, it, you know, it's a Trump-like threat, to be honest. Uh, saying, you do this, uh, I don't know which way I'm going to go. And they're also speaking to another group that is, um, you know, kind of important for the Democrats to kind of keep in the back of their mind. A lot of the people who voted in 2018 for some of these new, you know, that flipped some of these seats were in, were in formerly Republican suburbs. And uh, so they're trying to scare those people, you know, saying, hey, you know, maybe maybe Trump's, you know, maybe maybe these people are going too far. They're they're doing their own Trump thing on the left. So maybe, you know, at least Trump, we know what we got with this guy. Right. Right. And uh, so they're trying to kind of move the move, scare people that those people aren't going to vote for the Democrat, too. I don't think that I mean, I think Trump is bad enough that most people are going to hold their nose and vote for whoever the Democrat is, even if they've been propagandized by Donnie Deutsch. I mean, why we're listening to him anyway, I don't know. But this is something that's, you know, I, I mean, I assume Deutsch is a Biden guy. I don't know why I, I haven't heard him say that necessarily, but he just, I just expect that Biden is the general choice of that particular group. It's going to be very interesting to see how this all, you know, they all talk about lanes, which I hate. It was a 2016 trope that they came up with, but you know, Biden is going to be the establishment guy. And, you know, everybody's sort of thinking that, and I expect that somebody like, like uh, Deutsch will be, will be happy to back, you know, the, the good, you know, predictable Joe Biden. That's somebody that they say, oh, good, maybe we can get back to normal now. Biden looks like a president. He's the guy I really want. So, you know, I assume that that's where, that this fight is going to be had. Uh, on that basis. Like I said, this is going to be unpleasant. I hope everybody, you know, gird yourself because this isn't going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be No, fighting. this is going to be uh, super nasty. I mean, g- give me your sense of um, of uh, of where, of, uh, and I'm just looking at this. Um, it was funny. This is going to be interesting. Uh, Casey Hunt asked um, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, do you think that experience in terms of Beto O'Rourke has here in the House is strong enough foundation to jump to the Oval Office? And Pelosi was like, y- you ask me that when we have a president of the United States who, ne- <laughs> you know, well, uh, please. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. I mean, she did. She got halfway through that where she was basically like, we can't have a less experienced, less capable, less prepared president than Donald Trump. <laughs> um, and I think that's true. Um, yeah, it is. <clears throat> what do you think of Joe Biden? I mean, give me a sense of like, wh- wh- what do you think is going to happen with Joe Biden? I-, I know, like, you know, we have all learned enough to, um, uh, you know, keep our predictions, uh, you yeah. know, uh, as unambitious as possible. But where, where do you think uh, Joe Biden's, um, uh, wh- what do you think his chances are? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, looking at it from the perspective of, of you know, the, the modern Democratic Party where we are right now, there are just so many aspects of his past. It, there's so much baggage with Biden that, you know, it's hard for me to see how he can, you know, gain enough of the party to, you know, actually become the the nominee. I mean, I would expect there's a certain, you know, like the Donnie Deutsch people, the sort of, they're just looking for some reassurance that we were going to go back to normal, we'll get a normal, you know, mainstream Democrat guy, we know him, good old Uncle Joe, we know who he is, and, and then we can we can just get back on track. And I think people like, like you know, like you and, and, and me, you know, we, we sort of see that, that something's really fundamentally changed. We're, we're in a new world now, and that it, we're not going to go back to whatever what used to be normal, regardless of, of, you know, whether or not the Democrats take over. For some of the reasons we talked about earlier, that the Republican Party is now a radical faction, uh, gen, you know, basically, and and also that the Democrats have changed. I mean, there's a this is a new day in the Democratic Party as well, and and there's actually you know opportunity to kind of move push forward with a new agenda. And Biden is just not you know he he just does not fit into that. On the other hand, you know there are a lot of Democrats in in this country who are you know they're very you know mainstream kind of you know regular people who may not be on board with that and i, I honestly don't know i mean we're going to find out right. where, where this party really is we're going to find out over the next year just you know where where we're going with that it it is um 
it is a little bit nerve wracking because it's not in my mind. It's not just a question of going backwards, although I think that is, you know, exactly like people would like to reset it to a different time where we didn't have to sort of pay attention to politics. God knows I'd, I, I would. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and maybe that was a, a delusion. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite sure in many respects it was. But um, the the problem with going back too is that. To the extent that there is, you know, wide support out there for Biden, it seems to me it's going to be two parts, right? One is going to be just sort of people in the know who are convinced we need to have someone to win. They're convinced that it's going to take an old white guy to defeat uh, Donald Trump. I'm not sure what the logic is behind that. Uh, maybe that's, you know, there's there's basically two scenarios where the Democrats take back take the presidency uh, that people are talking about. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive, although they could be seen that way. One is through the uh, post-industrial Midwest, where you go back and you win Pennsylvania, you win Wisconsin, you win Michigan, and uh, those three states make it happen uh, from 2016. Or you end up, uh, you know, going the Southwest and you take a bunch of states there that, you know, are on the cusp of turning blue. Uh, They're not mutually exclusive propositions, although, you know, uh, certainly one candidate might be the, 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 Profile of one candidate might be more um, uh, applicable to one of the others. But one concern I have is we, you know, to just end this conversation in many respects where we started it is without the Democrats moving forward with uh, some type of an agenda that represents, you know, a fairly substantial change from the past. And I feel like, you know, frankly, Warren and uh, Sanders in many respects, from a programmatic standpoint, are the only ones who offer that type of thing. Um, we run the risk of, you know, sort of um, of a similar sort of frustration uh, bubbling up again. And that type of frustration, I think, is uh, much more susceptible to being exploited by a smarter version of Donald Trump. Um, and... Like there needs to be we to the extent, you know, Beto's argument is the way that we get out of this is by just coming together. <laughs> and um, I find that hard to believe that that happens that way. I think uh, the way that we get out of this, it seems to me, is to change the paradigm and such that um, the uh, the current narrative from the right is really hard to sustain. I think we're always going to have, not always, but I think we're going to have 30, 40 percent of this country that are going to be uh, ass backwards, frankly. Um, you know, like dug in ass backwards. Uh, but the the dynamic has to be such that they're they're just less motivated in some way. Um, and you know, uh, are, are are kept busy in other ways, I guess. I'm not sure. There needs to be a paradigm shift, it seems to me. Just the Maybe idea... Maybe chastened. What? <laughs> just a little bit chastened. Maybe they just have to sort of recognize that they, you know, that there's... that they're not going to... that they're not going to prevail. Well... That the country is not where they are. Yeah, I don't think they're... See, the thing... I don't think they're ever going to... Um, they're ever going to change their perspective. I mean, I think it's going to take generations. I just think that the ability to weaponize those people by more powerful forces has to be undercut. And that may involve just undercutting those more powerful forces, right? Like, you know, uh, and and that being that you need to sort of, in many respects, kneecap the, um, the moneyed interests that weaponize these people and rather than trying to you know change those people because i think there's mounting evidence that like you know uh, we interviewed somebody on this program uh, o- over vacation who basically could track racism as practiced through politics based upon down to the county level on what the ratio of of uh, slaves uh, to um, the black slaves to white uh, people were, and if you can do that, two hundred and fifty, you know, two hundred some odd years later, yep. um, one hundred and eighty years later, 
uh, I'm sorry, we've got a couple more generations to go, right? Yeah, and it's true. It's true. And maybe, maybe it's just, you know, an intrinsic sort of built into our system. I mean, I've often thought that, you know, we were born, this country was born on the back of this, this tremendous divide. It happened, it was there from the very beginning, and it's consistent. We even had a civil war. It didn't fix it. Yep. You know, I mean, so, you know, this is not, but it does not have to be this toxic, and it doesn't it, have to be this dangerous. I mean, there can't, this divide will exist. It just, it, there's got to be, and we have had those periods where well, where we were, reasonably able to to live side by side well and and when you think about those periods i mean to the extent that you know uh you know um i think when some of those periods were periods where frankly we still were basically living with uh you know uh, multiple series of of sub class uh, citizenry right <laughs> where people mm-hmm. were second class citizens third right. class citizens well, that's true yeah uh but to the extent that there was, you know, um, uh, some type of, of equilibrium, it was when uh, money, essentially, big money was restricted. Yep. And um, so the real the real question is, like, you know, do we have a programmatic, you know, and I think like, you know, Sanders, like you say, and Warren, uh, um, uh, Warren represent a threat to these powerful classes that weaponize the, this divide and these people. And um, that is why I think, like, I worry about a presidency that doesn't kneecap those uh, people who have an outsized political power in our society and use uh, those th- th- that that divide um, to their advantage. It seems to me. But we'll have more yeah. time to talk about this, uh, Digby, and it's going to get uh, yeah. a lot messier. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. Have a great weekend, Sam. You, you too, Debbie. Bye-bye. Bye. Check it out, folks. Uh, you can read Heather's stuff at Salonda. We didn't even get to the story that she did on um, on the potential for this sort of Chinese scandal that um, uh, there, there seems to be a little bit more there, uh, you know, coming out of these, um, these day spas than uh, we might have uh, anticipated. But... Uh, who knows? And um, uh, but we will have uh, Digby back. You can check out her writing at salon.com or on her blog at uh, Hullabaloo. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, Matthew, film guy. Just a reminder, folks. This program relies on your support. You can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do. You not only support this show for just uh, pennies a day, but you also get extra content every day. We'll be right back. Matthew Film Guy. We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is that time on a casual Friday where we will uh, seek out. I mean, this is how this segment actually started, was uh, back in the day uh, when uh, I would look for a film recommendation for the weekend from uh, someone who I thought was ostensibly a film uh, critic. It turned out he was just an entertainment reporter. Uh, and uh, denied being a film critic after um, literally, I think, a year or two on the program. That was a little bit upsetting. So um, we jettisoned that guy. Nice guy, but still, you can't come on and uh, 
Can't lie about your credentials. Can't lie about your credentials. So instead, what we did is we got a professor uh, from the accredited JCC uh, learning annex course uh, in um, in in Queens to come on and thus inspiring this song. Matthew, film guy. Let it play out. And then the pregnant That is correct. Pause. Listen to the lyrics. It tells you all you need to know. All you need to know. Uh, Matthew, film we guy. We could have worked in something there. We could have work, worked in something there about the uh, learning annex class, but uh, probably would have extended the running time. So you just have to fill us in on that each week. Now, you're not technically a professor, right? I mean... Well, yeah. When I teach at Sacred Heart University and their graduate... Uh, film program I am I mean it's, oh, you know it. it's a suck adjunct it. or whatever it's not like I'm 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 tenured or something but yeah wow is that right I didn't realize I mean so what how does your uh, are you doing that or is that you just was that a hypothetical no I, I that I'm not doing it I aspire someday to do that oh no I'm doing that of course I'm doing that well actually I didn't do it this year because as you know I was on the road for six weeks, but um, yeah, for the past four years. So, how does your class did. at the Learning Annex differ from your 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 uh, your class at what is it uh, Sacred Heart? Did you say? Yeah, I actually was teaching editing, the art of film editing at Sacred Heart University. Oh, being one of my specialties. So you were and editing then at the Learning editing. Annex class. It's just general film appreciation, showing art films to senior citizens with you know what I thought uh, of higher than usual curiosity so so can, wait a second can film by Matthew hear me yeah hold on for one second okay. so yeah, so wait you. a second so so you weren't actually teaching film you were teaching editing uh, I'm sorry Sam maybe you're under the mistaken impression but editing is film it is yes there is there is no film without editing it is the one pure form of expression that is unique to film there is no writing, well wait like a second you're making you a category acting, like drama. right there is no uh there is no um uh, there is no labrador retriever that isn't a dog but there are dogs that aren't labrador retrievers you can learn the skill of editing and not necessarily apply it to film and i don't mean just the medium i'm talking about the sort of the narrative structure i mean let's be honest People could be taking that uh, video class and all they could do is end up coming and doing like, I'm going to you know, put some B-roll in over uh, Sam talking about, you know, uh, Beto O'Rourke. Uh, you know, don't confuse, don't confuse the technical side of things, which is actually 50% of what I do teach at the, at the Sacred Heart University graduate film program with the understanding of how to use the aesthetics of film editing. But, I mean, I, you obviously have a, a point of view. You're flogging here, and uh, I don't want to argue with you. It's your show. And uh, I'll just uh, agree to disagree. Okay. I just, I'm a little sensitive because I just I remembered uh, the way that, uh, you know, we, the last time we had, you know, we, a, a, in your intro it just came up. I had recalled the, the moment when I learned that uh, our film critic was actually, yes. you know, not a film critic. Yeah, you've been burned before, Sam. I'd be, I'm going to be very sensitive right. about that. Yeah. Uh, well, once something, twice shy. I can't remember. I'm sorry. Once, once burned, once twice shy. Bitten. Once burned, twice shy. Once bitten. Uh, once bitten. Once bitten, yeah. once bitten, twice shy. Um, I'm sorry, Michael. Did you want, wanted to question no, further no, it's, on that? No, it's fine. We, we we I think we moved past that. I was just I was thinking of because uh, everything. Partially, I'm tired, but now because I'm rewatching The Sopranos, everything is a Sopranos reference in my mind right now. So I need to stop watching that show as quickly as possible. <laughs> but when I thought of Film Guy Matthew with his nice uh, uh, elderly Jewish students, 
I thought of Polly Walnuts taking his mom and her friends out to yeah. retirement home to go to, to, go, yeah. to go watch a play. And then, yeah. Anyways, I'm not going to go on from there because I'll just start repeating the show. But that that is now how I see, I see Matthew as an intellectual version of Polly Walnuts, Walnuts being like, Ma, it's a German oh. film. It's about incest, but it's really about capitalism. Come on. <laughs> So now, wait you and a the second. ladies so, will love it. So, all right. Well, so, so with all that true. said, I mean, uh, dead I, on. Di- what what is the similarity between the editing class that you teach and uh, the one at the JCC? Well, obviously, the one at the JCC is much more expansive. It takes in all aspects of the film experience, and it's more sense. It's more designed to broaden the kind of aesthetic and you know kind of artistic sensibilities of of the of the class whereas the editing class you know i do couch it in a kind of broader context of various film theories and the kind of language of film but also we're talking about you know accomplishing a very specific technical goal as well so you know one is a deeper and more narrow dive but uh they have a lot of overlap you know, I have my own personal theory of what makes a film good. I try to editorialize less than the actual editing class because I am trying to impart a skill that they can use to go ahead and get a job or make a film or just be empowered to make their own kind of craft. But, um, you know, they, they, what's the, what's the commonality? Me, Sam, Matthew, the film guy. I am the commonality. <laughs> well, all right. There you go. That's very Beto O'Rourke. You know, you got yeah. You can't be. You can't be teaching. You can't teach art objectively. You know, you kind of have to give it your personal attention. And I try to give my, you know, my enthusiasm for the art form in in every lesson. And uh, hopefully, you know, the best you can do is inspire someone to pursue their own path when it comes to art. They're not going to do it exactly the way you did it or somebody else did it. It's a fool's errand to try to reverse engineer art and try to just figure out how someone else did it. You kind of have to give them a few basic skills and then uh, the belief that they can do it. Well, I guess it's uh, just going to be a matter of time if some other JCC comes around and tries to uh, poach you uh, based upon wanting to have Matthew Film Guy at their uh, JCC to compete with the Learning Annex in Queens. Oh, yeah. I got various JCCs playing against each other right now as we speak. It's a, it's a, it's a whole system I've worked out. Yeah. I teach the old ladies... Dan- Danish anti-consumerist <laughs> incense cinema here. You stay the fuck out of Queens. <laughs> yeah. Is there a, is there a lot of competition amongst the uh, learning annex uh, film uh, film teachers? Oh, I'm in. Yes, I'm in. I'm in high demand. High demand. No, but Actually, I mean, I mean, totally I'm honest, just saying, like, been... when you come and try and infiltrate, let's say, you know, um, uh, Western Long Island. Right. I know him. That's Paul Ginsburg. He like, dropped yeah. out of Tish. Yeah. Why is one he... credit shy? He's been trying to move you... into the Long Island market for years now. You're supposed to stay on excuse the North me. Shore. What are you doing here? Please excuse me. You take your DOS boat <laughs> and go back to New Jersey with it. You know nothing. If of the, the Matthew cinema, Film Guy, let's put it this way: if you were to have, if you were to have a a conflict that could devolve into physical uh, to a physical conflict with another learning wow. annex film uh, teacher, over what genre of film would it be? Like, what would you find so offensive that you were forced to actually get physical? I'm not sure I completely follow the question, but if well, in other words, to like I, me, I, no, I mean, like, let's say there was a a, a hypothetical uh, teacher who was a uh, you know film uh, a t- a guy who was coming from a different part of Long Island to come into Queens to teach at the Learning Annex. However, they embraced, let's say, I don't know, uh, a a a. Uh, a more naturalistic style of filmmaking than you did, or uh, just for an example, oh, I know that's actually you, not the case. You're you trying know, to piss you know him off right now. Man. What's that? Well, but I'm just suggesting, I understand you would be the guy in that scenario who would support the naturalistic style of filmmaking. What would they who's support? Co- who's coming in? Who's coming into my territory, Sam? What, what are you talking about? I'm just asking a hypothetical. Do you, do you know somebody that's trying to? I don't want to make you paranoid. I'm just asking a hypothetical. There's a lot of talk. Oh God, Sam! 
Come on, Sam. I thought you had my back on this. All okay, right. I'll, I'll answer your, your silly question. The Thank silly you. answer is, if I say if somebody wanted to come out and say, I understand John Cassavetti better than you, Matthew Film Guy, then I would have to throw down. Okay, all right, there you go. Like, I told you, I studied Castavetti. <laughs> you don't know a exactly. fucking thing about Castavetti's. Uh, and then Sam's exactly. pulling him off. He's like, he's like, he's like, it's hey, not, it's, hey, Sam, I got a right to defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear what he fucking said? So, all right. So with that said, I don't know how we got on this. Um, it's actually really not a bad character. I think, I think honestly, it's because you and Michael are both very tired at the end of a long week, and it's yeah. a perfect time for just concentrate a little bit on some self-care, a little bit of uh, casual Friday, step away from the politics battle, the knife fight, and have some, uh, uh, you know, a, a moment of kind of uh, reflection on, on everything that's important. Why do I feel like that is a uh, sort of a, uh, a a prologue to your um, yeah. uh, to your uh, to it's your like a door to door vacuum offering. salesman pitch right. right there for the Danish? Can I interest you in the XJ7 cinema experience? No, what uh, what uh, what do you have for us this week? Well, to be honest, that's the setup for every week. Like, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do here. I think that's what's needed on this show is just a little bit of a step back from the sort of uh, the trenches. And to go a little bit more uh, wide view, I see. and uh, you know, so I, I could I could talk about some of the films that I've been shown in my class. Like you know, actually for me personally, there's always going to be no matter how big a film guy you are, there's always going to be some dark areas in your experience. And I've been trying to fill in some of the gaps, and I've been getting into uh, Hirokazu Koreeda. I don't know if anybody is a fan of his films, a Japanese filmmaker who's really been making world class films for over twenty, maybe even thirty years. Uh, I'm starting at the beginning with him, and I showed his film Mabarosi, which is sort of an homage to Ozu, another filmmaker who I love, a Japanese filmmaker from uh, post-war Japan, and that was great. Um, I could also maybe talk about another filmmaker who I'm in love with, uh, aesthetically speaking, named Lucrecia Martel. She's from Argentina, and she's only managed to make four movies so far. Uh, but the two of them that I've seen have both blown me away. I think I may have mentioned one in passing called La Cienega, uh, about a kind of uh, idle kind of rich class in uh, Argentina. And the one I recently showed my class is called The Holy Girl, which is kind of hard to explain, but it's basically about a teenage girl who lives at her family's hotel and a dental convention comes in. And she may or may not have been molested by one of the dentists. I'm sorry, the eyes, ears, and throat doctor. But um, it, it's told in a very kind of um, even-handed, not editorialized style, very nuanced, and it's really uh, just a, 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 a gut punch of a film. Um, but you know what, Sam? I'm gonna I'm gonna hey, detail this week's suggestion. Yeah. If she's Go so good, why don't she make more movies? <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, the patriarchy gets in her way. Four is um, not a lot. <laughs> no, it's not a lot. But you know what? Quality is important more than quantity, I think. And she's only been making movies since 2001, so, you know, we'll see. Right. Actually, people have floated her name as someone who should direct a superhero movie, but that's more of a... That is, that's story. kind of the sure new thing, happening. right? Is to get like actual like good. Is that the only of... reason why people go into film now? Is to to do some work uh, that that gets them in a position to do a superhero movie. But that's well, the new exactly. thing. Like, like we want to instead of hiring like I don't I forget the guy's name, but like some you know some blockbuster idiot. The new thing is like oh he made a you know a movie about like a, an old couple dying together in the south yeah. of France. He should make the new Marvel movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like people yeah. say, even Wolverine. That is kind of what they've been doing, but that's not the only movies that are being made. That's just the ones that they are, being are a little made bit better. Actually, I could say. Yeah, well, I mean, look, movies cost a lot of money, right? And decisions seem to be made mainly based on money rather than artistic choices in uh, the, the the big budget movies, wouldn't you say? In Hollywood, absolutely, no doubt. I, I think that sucks. I mean, people think communist art is bad, but like. Look at all the look at all the crap in the cinemas. Like that's what that's the art of capitalism. Enjoy. Absolutely, no doubt about that. But you have to remember that there is more film out there besides what comes out of Hollywood. It, you know, there's the American independent scene, and there's also the international film scene with actually a lot more public support than anything in America gets. So that's why someone like 
Corey Ada or Lucretia Martel can, can have careers making films that, you know, may not necessarily reach every senior citizen in Western Queens at first, but, you know, eventually they'll appreciate it when they see it. Right. Um, we have to be sort of thankful for these small favors. But listen, I, I do want to recommend a film, a classic Hollywood film that Sam, I think you will literally want to actually see. Mm. And uh, I recently saw it. It's actually a Western. Oh. I don't know how into Westerns you are. I'm not necessarily a real Western guy. I'm not really uh, a fan of that genre per se. Well, like as the, you know, the, the I am a, of its... I am a big fan of uh, the Eastward uh, Westerns, <clears throat> you know, in the not just the spaghetti Westerns, but even uh, things like um, uh, Josie Wells and uh, Painter Wagon Drifter. Red, High Plains Drifter, Painter Wagon Red, not so sure, much. Sure. That's that's a joke uh, for those of us in the... No, I... uh, yeah, the Clint yeah, Eastwood. Uh, Wagon. That's the, the film that killed Hollywood and made it right for the uh, film breath to come in. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, a fan of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. I think that is one of the that's that film. I think is amazing. Uh, frankly, Sam uh, Peck and Paul. That's a yeah. great one. Bob Pe Dylan. Great soundtrack. Great soundtrack. Yeah, and one. also was like the sort of, you know. Unforgiven, which was an Eastwood movie, in my mind, was a complete ripoff of of, of Pat Garrett, Billy the Kid, in terms of um, that notion of like, you know, this was not as um, as sort of honorable and uh, you know cool as it was. It was yeah. just like guys yeah. who could barely shoot well, you know, shooting at each other. Basically, was it? But yeah. Uh, but so yes, I definitely am open to um, the western as a genre. Great. Well, then you're going to love this film because this really does fit into the sort of movement post Vietnam where the Western stopped being these kind of like uh, moral tales of triumph against the savage and taming the Wild West and started to introduce a little bit of elements of like, oh, wait, there was a concomitant genocide that came with all of these cool shootouts. There was this entire kind of a land grab that we went through. And it wasn't as honorable and noble as you're saying. Like, in fact, Garrett and Billy the Kid is a great example of that. McCabe um, and Mrs. Miller. Like the Wild Bunch. Right, Wild What's Bunch. That? McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Wild Bunch, yes. Exactly. Good. Wild Bunch, exactly. All these filmmakers started to kind of revisit the Western. And, uh, you know, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, that was Altman. He's a definite auteur. And the two others, Wild Bunch, of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, that's Sam Peckinpah, another kind of... Uh, uh, auteur if even if he's sort of on the more lowbrow side uh this one was actually directed and stars kirk douglas who's not necessarily known for his hard-hitting uh artistic uh sensibilities but he made a film in 1975 called posse that actually mm. also stars bruce dern in one of his greatest roles i think and i think this is like right up your alley sam because it's it's basically about a marshal who is has political aspirations. He's trying to capture the most wanted man in the West, played by Bruce Dern, who actually winds up being somewhat of the anti-hero because Kirk Douglas is so obviously corrupt. He's basically doing everything he does for political advantage. And without spoiling too much, you kind of watch and see how Bruce Dern as the criminal winds up being the more honorable of the two. So uh, I was highly uh, surprised. There's, there's a little bit of Bla uh, Billy, uh, Billy the Kid in that a little bit too, right? I mean, yes, that's right. And it's you know it's it's kind of surprising how you know, and this was sort of early-ish. Well, no, this is like '75, so Vietnam was just ending. But it's really the, the the script surprises you where you think it's going, even when you have your eye on the kind of um, cynicism that you might be expecting. It's definitely uh, a rewarding and uh, just uh, a surprising, entertaining movie. So now, my understanding uh, is Kirk, my Kirk Douglas actually uh, directed this. That's right. I believe I said that. If I didn't, my mistake. But yes, Kirk Douglas directed it. This was the 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 seventies, early seventies, were the best period for film for for in terms of like scrutinizing, um, you know, sort of. It, it, it was the best way to sort of capture the the sort of change in the perspective Doesn't that people Matthew had. Doesn't Matthew know of, that you guys both know the the 
actual economics of why that's the case, right? Yes. That's fast. That's always interesting to me. If that was that, that book by uh, Bogdanovich wrote the uh, Raging Bulls. Fascinating. Uh, blankety blank. I can't remember what that book was. Yeah. Now. Well, you you mentioned you, you mentioned. Uh, paint your wagon that was known as kind of like the dead end that the hollywood uh, studio said like we have no idea what america wants right now this was a huge flop let's turn the keys of hollywood over to this younger generation which was people like spielberg and coppola and lucas and scorsese etc et brian de palma and yeah it did it was a weird historical blip sometimes between the 70s and basically the early 80s when star wars and jaws made everyone realize, like, oh, wait, we don't have to try so hard uh, to make these movies make money. We can just kind of make them spectacles again. That there was this kind of weird blip where the mainstream films actually contained some artistic merit, yep. some artistic kind of point of view, and took risks in a commercial sense that today you just, you just won't see. But, and yeah, Posse fits right in there along the lines of things like, you know, Clute or All the President's Men, Three Days of the Condor, these things that had a kind of, downbeat kind of uh the long goodbye you remember that one the long goodbye that was a good genre exercise by uh altman yeah long goodbye yeah it was a good era picture show uh says brendan last picture show last picture show uh yeah that was a great uh era for film all right well posse i'm gonna watch that um uh, ASAP. It's on iTunes. You can you can buy it on rent it on iTunes for four. On bucks. the That's iTunes. Okay, it. great. I've heard of that. The iTunes. Uh, we will check it out. I, iTunes. I pronounce it iTunes. I will. All right. Different folks. Different strokes. Uh, Matthew, film guy, as always, an immense pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. I'll give you one uh, chance to plug an eBay product that you have this week. What do you have? Well, I don't have any auctions going right now. I've put back on all of my high-end Majority Report merchandise. I have the mouse pad. I have the T-shirts. I have the signed bags of air, signed by Sam Cedar himself, bags of actual Majority Report studio air. And, and you can make me an offer. No offer is too small. Come on in. Oh. Clear out my stuff. Let's take it easy. And we'll see you there. All right. Matthew Film Guy, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, I would watch out. yourself, my friend. Um, I can tell you that we have not only signed bags of air in this office, but we also have them certified. Uh, and as far as I know, Matthew Film Guy's air bags are not certified. Certified to be from the air of this office. There's limited quantities, but there's also more where that came from. That's <laughs> There's a little bit of both. Folks, just a reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member and support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. As always, if you cannot uh, uh, afford a membership but you want access to the extra content that we produce every day, uh, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com and then wait uh, an extraordinary amount of time for us to get around to you. But we will, and we do. And if you don't hear from us, uh, feel free to email us again. Uh, because uh, sometimes our system breaks down, as it were. Also, don't forget, oh, we got, I get sent uh, posters today. Um, uh, Brendan, will you grab that one of those posters? I meant to um, show that. We got uh, sent a poster. It's in those uh, two slabs of uh, cardboard. Got sent a poster today from uh, when I was out at Just Coffee in Wisconsin. I saw a poster of Marin's. Um, a label and there's only two labels that they they make that are accustomed uh, to podcast shows one is uh, marin's at uh, wptf and then one is ours and there it is the uh, just coffee mr poster this is uh, a collector's item uh, that will not be on matthew film guys ebay but you can get the majority report blend as you can see it's a medium blend um and um uh, you can also get all sorts of other uh, type of uh, roasts, dark roasts, medium roasts, um, the light roasts at uh, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code uh, majority, get 10% off. Uh, today is Friday. Tuesday is also a day. Michael, what happened on Tuesday? Joshua Kahn taught us using The Simpsons how to organize a campaign going back to the history of uh, leftist organizing. He's the executive director of the Wildfire Project. John Iderola joined us. We see we sort of sized up the 2020 field, and we took a lesson from Cornell West on the distinction between buzzwords and showing up 
to explain how to think strategically and morally about 2020 patreon.com slash tmbs or become now we're less than 100 away one of the first 32,000 subscribers on our youtube channel jamie so um we were gonna wait until monday to release this uh episode of history is a weapon as a bonus for our patrons maybe try to get a few more patrons to sign up but uh it felt extremely relevant unfortunately to the shooting that just happened in new zealand so we decided to release it today for free to everyone um so in this uh history is a weapon sean and uh, matt chrisman from chapel trap house go over this book from the 1970s called camp of the saints by gene respy which is you know currently experiencing something of a renaissance among these right-wing populist figures like Steve Bannon and Marine Le Pen. Um, I took a look at it. It's some of the most horrible, racist stuff that you'll ever read in a book. Uh, it's about, you know, these like waves of brown immigrants who want to destroy this mythical thing called the West. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible to look at, but I think it's also really important to understanding um, the framework, the, the ideological framework a lot of these people are operating within. Um, and unfortunately, I think it will remain relevant until we confront the roots of this horrible problem. So I'm sorry that's not, that's a little depressing, but. Uh, I just had an image of Sam as a, uh, as like a Breitbart host being like, it's called Camp of the Saints. <laughs> it's a really important book about immigration, do you see? Uh, m speaking of books, uh, tomorrow on Literary <laughs> Hangover, we're doing the first uh, bestseller, which is uh, actually a, 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 a book in the genre of racial paranoia, uh, The Captivity Narrative of Mary Rowlandson. Uh, and uh, its context, uh, King Philip's War, or Metacomet's Rebellion, as uh, we should probably call it. So uh, check, look out for that tomorrow. What that do you mean the first best sale, a bestseller? Was that when they just instituted the, the, the metric or what? I mean, it was like the first notable publication that was printed, basically. Like th it was widely sold on both sides of the Atlantic, um, basically. Uh, and if you wanted it in like Virginia, you'd have to buy it from the UK because that's how publishing worked back then. But uh, yeah, it was a big, big seller. People Because people were very interested in, in Native American life and uh, Native Americans in general, um, because they didn't know much about them and they were colonizing their land, but you could never hear about it unless it was either through a missionary narrative or a captivity narrative because if somebody actually just went and became part of the Native Americans, which uh, a lot of colonists did, they wouldn't be allowed to write about it. You so know what would be fun, Matt? And if you did like some, like uh, the Da Vinci Code too, like you just mixed in a couple of like really wildly bad books. It's not, that I might mean, be fun. there has, in the, in the early days before Literary Hanger was not, was launched. Uh, was, the early days. Well, yes. there was a pilot episode of, uh, of um, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Which one? Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, the, dude. Nice. That Make was that on the information. Yeah, there get you go. that out there. All right, folks. Uh, totally quick break. I want to hear a high Matt talking about <laughs> Head into the fun half. We'll be right back. Calling from a 919 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Wow. Awesome. 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 Well, let, let's just do this exercise. Do it. Oh, oh. Super sick. It's all good. Super sick. Hell yeah. Right. You don't need to means test social security. You don't need to means test Medicare. Nobody cares. The way that you means test that. To tax wealthy people more. What's the point? And that's just simply not enough. And as you always say, as soon as you stick in that access, yeah. list, then we already do have universal health care. Right. I have access to BMW. Right. This is a weird, weird, weird time for politics right now. That's legit. Galaxy brain. This is a freak shit. Love it all. He finally gets to fulfill his destiny. Burger Somalia. That's the well, baby. Very legal. Very legal. I thought this was a joke. Hamburger glared. Well, I mean, I don't. But things are really bad. Bad, 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 bad.
We are back. The fun half was a very, a very the majority report with Sam Cedar remix by um, Riptide. Riptide. Um, what should we play first? <laughs> Let's just loosen up things. Yeah. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of talk as to whether or not Sean Hannity is actually uh, alive. And um, part of this uh, questioning his actual existence as to whether, and not, I don't mean animated. He is, of course, animated. We see him on TV every night. But some people are questioning whether or not he's. Is he undead? Is he the undead? Uh, because that would explain a lot of what he's able to do on television in terms of repeating uh, zombie lies and, uh, and whatnot. And here he is. This is uh, a segment that he did uh, with, um, I can't even remember his name now. I can't even remember either uh, one Mike of Mike Huckabee, I don't know. Mike Huckabee, other. yes. Um, and um, there's a bug crawling all over Sean Hannity as he is live on television. This is pretty awesome stuff. Um, let's just watch and see if um, anybody notices. But thank you, and Governor, the great bug. to see you. Thank right you for on being his with us. Uh, when we come back, Trace Gallagher's here next to give us all the new developments. Now it's on his neck. In two cases, Jesse Smollett it's and the his college admission scam. He doesn't move scam. at all. Geraldo Rivera, Rachel Campos, Duffy will join us. Up. And it's our villain of the his day chin. <laughs> was involved in a really oh shocking God. crime. He must you feel will it. see that straight ahead. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, remember when Tara Reid didn't realize that her boob was out because she had fake boobs? No. I feel like this is somewhat <laughs> analogous. <laughs> Who's oh, Tara Reid? Okay. I, <laughs> once again, I find no. your lack of pop, pop no. culture knowledge very no. charming, if slightly unbelievable. Um, just take my word for it. She's an actress. Was this on television? No, no, no. Uh, this is not. No, no, no. Let's be real here. This is not. I do literally don't believe that Sam has never heard Ace of Base. There's no way that's true. But not knowing who Tara Reid is is super plausible. I'm going to. Sam definitely gets a pass on this one, let alone like an obscure, uh, random, embarrassing. Well, while we don't her. know who Terry, Terry Reed is, this is, I think, the bug, uh, stink bug. Oh, yeah. No, I'm fully aware of a stink it's, bug. It's not important. It's not important who Terry Reed is. My point is uh, same similar thing, I think, is going on here because he has a fake face because he is, of course, a reptile wearing the face of a human. He could be. Uh, I think there's a lot of theories. He could be a changeling. Uh, he could be part of the undead. I am the undead. Yeah, it's... I want him to say it in his cadence. Uh, that stink bug, incidentally, they call him a stink bug because when you, you squish it, they smell really bad. Oh, really? Yeah. That's what it is. Um, and, uh... Well, don't squish it. Don't yeah, but nobody it. calls Sean Hannity. Nobody calls Sean Hannity. Uh, stink bugs pouring out of Sean Hannity's body. Um, it's like a sign of the apocalypse. It is. Uh, or maybe it's a sign of good things to come. <laughs> so, Yeah, it's knows? like the bird and Bernie. Yeah, yeah, the He's been cursed by a stink bug. So let's play this clip from uh, uh, Pod Save America. And, and this is what I find, you know, sort of somewhat... I mean, I, you know, look, I don't listen to Pod Save America on a regular basis. I know a lot of people do. Uh, that's all well and good. I think uh, probably uh, on balance, they're a net positive uh, wow, somebody's for... Somebody's trying to keep their options open on Bumble. <laughs> Bumble. I did have on my... Uh, back in the day on my uh, Bumble profile, I did say, let me tell you why you can do better than Pod Save America. I'm not disqualifying you, but do better. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's praxis. There was, uh, which was a big change when uh, just putting a Pod Save in America, a Pod Save America in your Bumble profile would get an immediate swipe, uh, whatever side is bad, uh, swipe left. Um, but... This type of stuff, I think, is, you know, sort of problematic because it's so reminiscent of another guy uh, in uh, who, in my mind, served a similar purpose, maybe, you know, different era, obviously, uh, where everything was a little bit uh, more to the right. But here's uh, John Lovitz. Um, 
echoing what I heard during the run up to the Iraq war, which was right war, wrong reasons or wrong reasons, but right war. One of the things that's very hard in this situation is that this is one of those rare times where Trump isn't getting everything totally wrong. Um, you know, this is a situation where just because Donald Trump has an ideological interest in proving something in Venezuela and just because he has not he has shown such deference to dictators around the world and has such authoritarian tendencies at home doesn't mean that there aren't places where we align on trying to remove Maduro. It's just that we might have a slightly different approach. Yeah, I mean. All right. And so here's the thing. I mean, um, the and I don't know what uh, they I don't know what the slightly different um, approach is that uh, these guys have. But the, the reason why we should not support intervention in uh, Venezuela is not because Donald Trump supports intervention. Um, the reason why we shouldn't support intervention in Venezuela is because none of our interventions, uh, and maybe somebody can come up with one off the top of my head, I can't think of one, but uh, it's much easier to think of our interventions in the past uh, that their net result has been the um, has been more destabilization, more violence, uh, an incredibly amount of durable destabilization and violence. For instance, you could just uh, get into a car and travel north from Venezuela uh, and get into uh, Central America. Maybe we wouldn't even have to go that far, actually. Um, uh, but. El Salvador and Guatemala and Nicaragua, that Honduras. Were Honduras, where places uh, have been highly destabilized and uh, because of U.S. intervention in one form or another. So there's nothing good that comes out of this. And you can certainly believe that uh, Maduro is anti-democratic, that um, the, the dissolution of uh, that, you know, the rewriting of a constitution, the dissolution of, uh, of a uh, legislative body and um, uh, jailing um, uh, his uh, uh, opposition parties in the run up to election. You can have a problem with all of this and still ultimately say the U.S. can't fix this problem. Uh, by intervening, it can only exacerbate uh, these problems. And even if there is a short-term fix that the U.S. thinks it has, uh, inevitably and invariably, these things go uh, south. And also, I mean, I will just do the, without opening all of it, certainly greatly contributed to the problem by our actions. But you, you outlined the bigger, more important points. But I think there's a smaller by your logic point here, which is actually really important for understanding how legitimately problematic things like pod save america and all this like resistance discourses because like if i was to stipulate that okay these are people who don't have an anti-interventionist anti-imperial view so they're susceptible to supporting policies that you know i just fundamentally oppose in a place like venezuela but they and especially pod save guys are supposed to be the types of people that really recognize that Donald Trump is, in fact, uniquely unable to do anything and uniquely dangerous. And there is just something extraordinary about people who rightly spend all day saying that he's racist, he's incompetent, he shouldn't be trusted with anything. And then the one area that they're willing to give him deference on is in one of the most dangerous, innately problematic areas that we do, period. That reveals a lot. The, w the, the exact same dynamic uh, took place when he started launching bombs into Syria. Right. I sat on the news on MSNBC with all of these ostensible, um, you know, sort of uh, um, folks who um, would otherwise oppose Donald Trump who are like, we need to do this and then come up with a plan. I'm like, who, who exactly is going to do this? Like you're you're sitting here telling us that Donald Trump is completely out of control or is completely incompetent. You're going to trust this guy to um, wage war on. I mean, like, like, what are we afraid of? What is anybody afraid of with Donald Trump? Like, you know, beyond what you would be afraid of, of your average uh, Republican policy. It is that he's going to get people killed <laughs> like that. He doesn't have um, the agenda of 
not just that he doesn't have the agenda of the United States in mind as his primary um, uh, motivating factor, and I would argue that I don't even know what that means, because I think different people, uh, different presidents would have different notion of what are uh, key American interests in any given sake, and what when doing something in the the uh, for the benefit of the United States, I think has a different definition for different people, depending on what part of American society they're in. But the bottom line is you're giving Donald Trump um, essentially the the keys to the car on, uh, you know, the night where there's more drunk drivers on the uh, uh, on the streets than any other night. You're right. giving him you're you're allowing this guy to um, operate in the most dangerous of contexts and uh so even under right by their logic it makes uh, no sense all right let's see what else uh, we have here let's go to the phones shall we uh ladies and gentlemen uh calling from a 213 area code who's this where are you calling from hey hey hello hello hey this is enrique from los angeles Enrique from Los Angeles, what's on your mind? Um, given that it's a casual Friday, maybe I wanted to ask, how fucking awesome was Joe Strummer? Was Joe Strummer? How fucking awesome. Yeah. Uh, he was pretty, pretty awesome. I've been listening to the, um, there's a podcast on Spotify about the story of the crash. Yeah. Narrated by Chuck D. And... Maybe the Pod Save America guys could use a little bit more of the class. <laughs> I think that's probably Seriously. the case. What's it called? Yeah, what were they listening to? Um, I, I have no idea what they were listening to. But what about, uh, what's the uh, podcast Green that Day. Chuck D um, uh, hosts? Oh, it's, it's all about the story of the class. I think they're three episodes in. But, I mean, I've been, I've been into... Uh, the class lately, and man, just Sandinista. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the class. Going on with Venezuela. Yeah. Indeed. By the class. Just take a listen to Washington Bullets and it is uh, maybe apparently it's called Stay Free: The Story of the Clash. Uh, yeah, oh. that is correct. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm gonna check that out. Actually, um, that's. Uh, Pretty typically cool of Chuck D, too, I would say. Um, yeah, Chuck yeah, D yeah. Is good. What do you think of, uh, can I ask you a question? Because you're clearly a, a punk yeah. music fan. What do you think of all of the uh, sort of leftist punk bands that uh, Beto says he likes, like uh, Fugazi. Fugazi, Minor Threat? Do you think that, uh, that uh, Minor Threat might turn out to be his... Uh, Rage Against the Machine. I'm talking about Paul Ryan. Like, are we going to find out what Ian MacKay thinks of Beto O'Rourke? <laughs> oh, let's hope not. Let, let's, let, let's not get Beto into the music territory. Or maybe he just should just stay in the music territory. And I think you might have something there. Leave I appreciate the call, Enrique. I'm going to check out that podcast. That's something that uh, I would uh, actually... What was the name of it again? It's called Stay Free, the uh, Stay story free. of the clash. Cool. What was uh, what happened Remember when Paul Ryan, it was reported he got into a van and started listening to Papa Roach. I, what, what, did, what, what did he fail at doing at that? Uh, uh, Obamacare appeal, and then he got into a, a, a SUV, and then this started playing. Cut my life into pieces. This is my last resort. Suffocation. All right, so I think it's really... It, there's just a, a debate I, that is closed is that Paul Ryan is the worst human being in American and probably global politics. He's horrible. Um, speaking of uh, horrible people, let's tune in to Fox News and their response to the, um, the, the terror attacks in New Zealand. And good for them for, um, you know, at the very least. Um, uh, now, they re reported this as at two mosques, and it was a coordinated uh, shootings, but wasn't it one, one person? Maybe this is when um, the uh, early, uh, early reports. But here's a uh, Fox um, talking about the, uh, the uh, New Zealand mosque attack. 
Reporting we're getting out of New Zealand that he wants to stand trial, and there's only one reason for that. He wants to make sure his views get expressed publicly. How sick is that? And well, Bill, you're absolutely right. Uh, normally, these types of shootings that we've seen in the United States, the uh, shooter takes their life within five to ten minutes of uh, the activity. So this individual is, is sick. He posted these rantings online beforehand. And also, you know, to take this military action, that's really what this is. You know, you go and you get this military-style weapon, and you go into a mosque where people are praying unarmed and just to slaughter them, you know, it, it becomes such a, a question of uh, insanity that someone would want to do this. But, you know, it, the question that has also been circulating whether or not this was an attack that was based upon religion or based upon immigration. The uh, New Zealand community has really been kind of struggling a little bit over the time in terms of how to deal with the immigrants. Uh, there's been a law, there was a law passed in, 19, in uh, 2017 that restricted the ability of foreigners to buy land within New Zealand because the, the housing prices were being inflated and citizens of New Zealand were feeling like they were being forced out. That could have played into, so we don't know if necessarily the motivation was against immigrants mm -hmm. or against Muslims in specifically. Uh, this is just bizarre to me. Uh, maybe they're just looking for stuff to talk about, but... Um the, you know, the the idea that these white supremacists have such a specific narrow set of of hatred, they don't they hate people who are not like them. And so it, 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 they don't they're not splitting hairs here in that manner. It is uh, hatred of the other. It is um, in the air, folks, uh, amongst the uh, uh, white world in particular, um, that uh, societies that are uh, supposed to be um, more multicultural are uh, the, those people who are afraid of somehow the, the dilution of white culture. Um, they promote these things. And, you know, I, I can't remember in what context, um, but there is obviously a difference between uh, a Donald Trump and the guy who uh, pulls the weapon from the back of his car in New Zealand and goes in and shoots up. Uh, and apparently there were two other guys. It's unclear whether they were involved, but apparently they had weapons, which is why that uh, report, that first report may have seen it as uh, coordinated attacks. But... Um, there's a difference, but they're on a spectrum and it's very hard to get to the shooter without first laying the groundwork that is being laid by those people who don't nearly go as far as the shooter, not just in terms of actions, but maybe they don't go quite as far as in terms of rhetoric. Um, he releases a, um, a, a manifesto than the form of a question answer. Here is uh, one of his questions. Uh, were slash are you a supporter of Donald Trump? Um, as a symbol of renewed white identity and common purpose? Sure. As a policymaker and leader? Dear God, no. So sort of fascinating, right? Like well, this is what Matt said in the beginning, not to interject, but Matt said before went on air is like, that's ex it's in many ways how we perceive like when we talk about it, how obviously there's the policy areas, but there's also just the cultural representation of overt white supremacy in the White House. Yeah, he gets it. Right. He may say like, yeah, no, I get he's incompetent. I don't have to support him for that. But we've got one of our own in the White House who right. is, um, you know, at the within the context of where society is today. This is very helpful for us. He's pushing the envelope, and uh, that's good from the perspective of a, a white nationalist, a white supremacist. Um, that's that's what they want. That's helpful. And in the same way that we talk about, you know, Donald Trump pushing the envelope, as it were, for white supremacy and white nationalism in the context in which he does. Uh, He's asked himself uh, these questions, too, from uh, where did you receive and research and develop your uh, beliefs? And he goes, uh, the Internet, of course, you will not find the truth anywhere else. I mean, 
Maybe some of this is tongue in cheek. Yeah, I think some of this is tongue in cheek because he, at in another part of the manifesto, clearly cites Brevik as his main inspiration. I think this Candace Owens thing might be like a little bit, but Candace Owens' reaction is interesting. Yeah. So uh, this guy, you know, uh, like I say, has a manifesto where he asks himself uh, questions and answers it. We don't know. Um, a lot of what these guys do is sort of, you know, somewhat ironic in the way that they uh, present on uh, online, um, that it's they like attempt to, um, that they they are, are trolls in many respects. So when he's asked himself, is there a particular person that radicalized you the most? He says, yes, the person that in- influenced me above all was Candace Owens. Now, he may or may not, um, that may or may not be a legitimate uh, answer on some level. He may see in his uh, twisted mind like, oh, this is going to be good. This will um, alienate her or she'll become problematic and we can get a non-white person out of. Like, look, I don't know that he's sincere about saying that Candace Owens, either Candace Owens did because, um, you know, she has been um, uh, quite explicit in, in talking about, you know, uh, uh, if France wants to build an army to defend itself against anything, it ought to be declining birth rate of its own people. I mean, this this sort of all signs indicate that it would be a Muslim majority country in 40 years. Maybe uh, she has a pro- you know, maybe he's being sincere. Uh, she goes on at one point to say uh, on Twitter, uh, reminds Sadiq Khan that according to the and that's the um, uh, mayor of, uh, of London. Uh, that according to the birth rate, Europe will fall and become a Muslim majority continent by 2050. There's never been a Muslim majority country where Sharia law was not implemented. I, I don't even know what, but uh, when we're forced to save you guys again, we'll forgive the balloon. I mean, Candace Owens says we have 50 million uh, Muslims in uh, Europe. These are signs that Allah will grant Islam a victory in Europe. She's talking, she's quoting Magar, uh, Muammar uh, Gaddafi in 1975. Muammar Gaddafi is obviously dead. <laughs> we, we killed him. But she says a Trump balloon won't save the UK. Well, the question is, what will then, Candace? Right, exactly. Like, I don't understand. Um, she's dealing, her response to protest against Donald Trump is to talk about the all the Muslims that are invading Europe. So maybe the guy who went and just killed 49 Muslims was genuinely inspired by uh, Candace Owens and her writing on Muslims. He, he did cite the birthright stuff in his manifesto. I mean, maybe he legitimately was. Or maybe he just feels that she shouldn't be in uh, the white supremacy, mo- perceives her to be in the white supremacy movement and just wanted to sort of like cause her grief, right? But why would he want, why would he, either answer does not put Candace Owens in a context that she should be very um, uh, proud about. One context is that he literally took her words about uh, Muslims to heart and was genuinely inspired. Or the other reason why he does it, because remember, this guy's obviously fairly deliberate with what he's doing here. He's not just picking random names out of a hat. He could be doing it because he wishes her ill will. And why would he wish her ill will? Well, he's a white supremacist. Maybe he wishes her ill will because she's black. But there are a lot of other black people that he might wish ill will to, probably some that um, are certainly less aligned, who are not out there saying things like about this with Muslims. Well, maybe he wants her out of the movement that she's in because it, t- it contaminates the movement. This is, this is the generous view as to why he would mention her in this and so he wants to cause her problems, and this he knows will be problematic to credit her with being, and to get her out. To get her out of what? Like, what is she in now that he feels that she's tainting? This is, this is the generous perspective. Super generous. So here is Candace Owen trying to defend herself today, and her response to, I guess... Um, the tweet was deleted. Uh, a tweet that what uh, indicated, you know, that she had been she mentioned in the in manifesto. There. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, LOL. She writes laughing very hard. Fact Good way to start it. I've never created any content espousing my views on the Second Amendment or Islam. Well, what? well we just read three yeah. tweets that went out to how many followers does she have? 
Also, what is this? How many followers is she? Hundred thousand, two hundred thousand? Maybe. How many? She has loading here. Um, oh, um, she's got one point one three million followers. All right, so maybe one point one three million followers um, who saw those tweets about Muslims. Maybe that. Maybe that it can is content but she never says uh i've never created any content espousing my views on the second amendment or islam i well the islam is true uh, i mean it's obviously false rather we've we've read those the left is pretending i inspired a mass massacre in new zealand in dot 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 as if the internet doesn't work in new zealand i mean i've never been in the same locale as candace owens i think in my life uh apparently she doesn't realize in new zealand that there's an internet uh, because I believe black America can do uh, it without government handouts is the reachiest uh, reach of all reaches. L-O-L. Very funny. Um, it's super funny. Of course, the left is not pretending that I inspired, uh, that she inspired the Moss Massacre. If anybody's pretending, yes. it is the Moss uh, massacre -er. And maybe he's pretending, maybe he's not. But the left isn't pretending. The left is just reading the guy's manifesto. And you know who else is reading the guy's manifesto? The right. Everybody's reading the manifesto. It says the exact same word regardless of your political ideology. I mean, so this is Candace Owens doing her best to deflect. Now, there's two options you have when you're Candace Owens. I regret that my name uh, was in this guy's manifesto. I have nothing to do with this. I find it ab uh, um, ab abhorrent. Um, I... I find violence. I find violence against immigrants. I find violence against um, uh, people because of their religion. Horrible. Uh, I, it is not my fault. I am in his, uh, you know, a lunatic can't be, uh, you know, I can't be held responsible for a lunatic who cites me, but um, it, it's, it's disgusting. So instead, her response is to like, this is hilarious. Look at those crazy lefties. Look at those craziest, crazy lefties reading something. And then uh, talking about what uh, the fact is. And the fact is, she was cited as his inspiration by him. That's a fact. And she should come up with a, you would think that the millions of dollars that they have to deal with the public relations, which is basically their job in the TPUSA, you can come up with somebody who has a better response than that. It's pretty gross. 49 people were slaughtered. By a man who said, you are the inspiration. Take a couple of minutes. Think about what you're going to say. Really? I mean. It's disgusting. Disgusting. And can, can we go back to what he said about Trump? Because it's such a dark mirror to how the left sees Bernie, right? It reminds me of something uh, our interviewee who, in who infiltrated the alt-right said which is, you know, people, regular white people right now have a choice. You can be white or you can be human. Um, the only way to fight fascism is with socialism. Like I know I'm always saying socialism or barbarism, but it's true. Like we are facing a crisis right now um, in many different ways. A crisis of ecology, a crisis of the profitability, etc. And Liberal institutions are collapsing all over the world. Everyone, everyone can see that. So one, one solution is for, you know, regular working people all over the world of all races and all genders to get together and demand a more equitable distribution of resources. Um, and the answer the right has come up with is to become tribalistic, um, have this imaginary idea of the West and white nationalism and say, we need to take care of our own. Everyone else is going to be exterminated, right? So there isn't a representative of either of those viewpoints right now in mainstream politics. But Trump, I think, is to the reactionary right of that as Bernie is to the left. And I'm just I'm scared of what's going to happen if the right wins. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Oh, Bernie's probably not going to pass a law to get rid of capitalism, but he's going to spread the message of, you know, brothers and sisters uniting as as a class to demand more for themselves. Um, what the right is saying is, you know, Trump's not going to 
literally put all brown people in concentration I mean, camps, although he's starting to do that. But he's spreading a message of white nationalism. And it's terrifying. I mean, I think if I was, frankly, going to vote exclusively on that sort of uh, the, 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 the symbolic message that you're talking about, um, you know, someone like Beto, I think that's what he's going to be running on, frankly, is um, this notion of, of uh, you know, uh, I think... Class I, conflict? No, I don't, I don't think that shooting was about class conflict in New Zealand. No, I'm saying that the left answer to the problems is class conflict and the right answer is white nationalism. Socialism okay. or barbarism being the two choices... Ed, so to the degree that we are that not that already living in barbarism. Okay. I just don't understand how... I, don't, I, I just don't understand it. I, I just don't understand how... It's a dark mirror to what the left is trying to do that is positive. That's all I'm saying. They view Trump in much the same way that the left views Bernie. Okay. I, 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 that may be the case. I just... I'm, I'm confused as to, like what i don't I, I, okay does anyone know what i'm trying to say um, no. well be, be more explicit here like so i don't know what dark mirror means uh um, i just wouldn't i would not i just don't compare, think like i just think like why even give anybody even the sound bite of the, I like I get I think I get where you're trying to go, but like let's not even give them the sound bite of comparing Bernie to to Trump. Um, yeah, I just don't. Um, I, I I I think that's a bad analogy. Um, I think I think it is analogous, but whatever, it's fine. Okay, uh, let's go to the phones. You're calling from an eight four seven area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's Josh from Chicago. Hello, Josh from Chicago. What's on your mind? Um, oh, uh, first of all, I wanted to, and I wondered if you could wish uh, my friend Zoe a happy birthday, uh, Sam. Happy no. birthday. birthday. No. Ha ha Sorry, Zoe. Excuse me. No. Happy birthday, Zoe. Oh, you, you cock. All right. Samantha Cox for Josh. Josh, uh, what else cocks, can we do for you? Who Cox for me, Josh? We all know our Ray Mandela. Uh, anyways, um, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, follow up uh, Matthew Film Guy's recommendation. Um, Lucretia Martel is awesome, and her new film, Zama, is really good, and so people should watch it. It's all about colonialism. It's actually really trippy. Um, and, but uh, I want to talk about this uh, Beto stuff. Okay. Um, is it just me, or do, like, I really don't feel like this guy has any chance and i think the reason why I mean, okay i might be speaking too soon but i think there are two things that bother me and i think the two reasons why i don't think he'll really go far i think he's kind of just going to crash and burn one he has like no message whatsoever and i think people our age aren't just looking for like a cool guy in like memes who like skateboards they're actually looking for like concrete a concrete message like concrete ideas someone like a Bernie Sanders or even Elizabeth Warren. But I also think his run smacks of just complete white male privilege. Like that Vanity Fair article, I don't know if he is aware of how he just came off looking like someone who is completely entitled. Um, especially, especially because like he didn't even win. And not everyone who didn't win was afforded the same privilege to just run for president the way he has it, it, it smacks of real narcissism well that that is the thing is that like you know if you read the if the if the piece did not include he's going to run for president and his politics and you read that vanity fair piece you're like this is a cool this is like this sounds like an interesting guy yeah, he's the guy who he's the guy who invented like uh, you know uh, the the blankety blank uh, box the bed you buy in the box but then when it comes to like, I've been, I mean, this sense that he, is, this is his destiny. Um, it is, it, it, it's, it's pretty stunning. And it's also, um, it, it, on some level, it's a little bit 
frankly, I got to be honest with you, I, I was a little bit scared by it because this is a guy who was completely intoxicated by the crowds that he uh, that he got when he was on the campaign trail. This is all stuff from the uh, and the existence of these crowds convinced him that he should uh, run for president. Um, and you're right without, um, you know, and he he at the very least, I think, recognizes uh, the oda- the audacity of him running in a, a Democratic uh, Party that it does not look like him increasingly. Right. And is um, mm-hmm. sort of like very interested in having um, I mean, so I I and I think, you know, look, anybody's allowed to run for president. I'm I'm sure. less concerned about the the sort of the white privilege that's there. I mean, that is something that is granted by society. He certainly, you know, he could run. I have a, it would be interesting if we could test, let's say, Stacey Abrams running against him, if we wanted to just sort of like do a, a an experiment. But what strikes me, what, yeah, or Andrew Gillum, what's what's what strikes me is um, the guy doesn't seem to have an agenda other than. No he was invigorated by running and that to me is just it's 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 almost scary none of the other <laughs> stuff would matter uh frankly like like i said this yesterday i actually made this point cuz i noted that thing of like i'm born to be in it man and it's like okay contrast that with bernie who's a total mission driven candidate or contrast that with uh, Kamala Harris, who, you know, obviously I view very differently to Bernie, but like she actually could not say that because she is not born to be in it because of the structure of our society. Right. She's overcoming huge barriers just by even being in the game. And I, but I said, like, look, I don't, you know, that's not my kind of content. And I think that it's a crutch in a lot of coverage and sometimes, so I wouldn't necessarily go there. If he came out with an actual policy agenda, well, but that is the yeah, which thing. is what like, you're saying. He just has nothing, so it's like, I guess it all is just personal entitlement. And being a you know a charismatic, a charismatic um, a guy is, is a type of Jew? like a, a charismatic, yeah, charismatic um, a white guy <laughs> who's born to be in it. Well, you know that is that's not showing the line. It's not that unique. I mean, it's like, yeah. well, no, like, and that's and that's kind of like the thing. It's like, honestly, from a mission and policy level, nothing from a I mean, look, we said this yesterday, Buddha gig, you know, he's a boring centrist white guy. He is a gay man. And that's significant. And he's also putting points on the he board. He's talking problems. about the Supreme Court. Right. He's talking about court. And his dad was a Marxist. His dad was a well, he's also has executive uh, uh executive um and and i'll just be uh, experience which is i i I was i i did shows months ago about like hey where's all the love for stacey abrams if there's all this for beto so i agree with that argument but neither of them should run for president in my opinion look they both would be great senate candidates i think my friend uh sophie wiener said it best when she said that uh beto is not the white obama he is in fact the white cory booker (laughs) yes I almost think that, like, Can actually, I just, no, I Cory Booker's speeches make more sense. But I will also say, Cory Booker yeah. has had, to be fair, I don't like what he did necessarily with that experience, but he's had substantial experience. Uh, you know, he was mayor of of Newark. He has, I can point to, you know, two or three main. Um, issue silos that Cory Booker has been involved with uh, that I would in, in, like attributes that I would find either positive or negative. Right. Cory Booker uh, has been involved in, um, you know, felt very strongly about charter schools and privatization of our public school education. I have a big problem with that. But at least he was married to something. Um, his um, criminal uh, his his criminal justice reform, you know, he has been committed to that. Uh, I have, like I say, I have problems with some of his issue positions. Beto, the amount of movement that he has done on issues, um, his his attachment to what he ran on uh, or what he's even running on now seems so tentative as to almost be impossible to see. Um, And 
to the extent that he is, has any attachment to these issues, it seems to be uh, rhetorical and simply over the course of, of, of the last election. So I don't know. That, to, to me, a guy like that who is convinced he's right for the role but doesn't have an internal, um, an internal uh, a compass as to why he's right for the role other than like it's right for him. This is like, you know, Connecticut for Lieberman in my mind. Uh, but just a guy who doesn't, who's. Yeah, I think I'd really yeah. enjoy it. Right. I think I'd really enjoy it. Yeah. I also want to step back a little bit because I do think, you know, he is doing an Obama impression. Uh, and Obama, setting aside the, the substance of the arguments, when you watch his speeches, they're, they're, they're word salads. Obama actually always gave extremely coherent, crafted speeches. Agree or disagree with the content. Right. Appreciate the call, Josh. Uh, what else we got here? Oh, this is um, Dr. Carlson, uh, of course, is uh, under uh, siege these days uh, because of the myriad of problematic things he said that uh, were, uh, I think you could argue, racist in terms of, uh, of folks from Iraq. They were certainly um, just uh, grotesque. Uh, and, of course, his uh, misogyny. And, of course, a uh, tough uh, month for him because he had uh, Rutger Bregman on and refused to put him on because Bregman was questioning the, um, the premise of his most recent populist turn. Uh, Tucker's been so desperate that he actually had to have Dave Rubin on to, um, to defend him. And when you, the best you can do is to get the Dave Rubin on to defend you, you know you've got a problem. So uh, he turns hey, to um, Heather McDonald. Um, who is Heather McDonald? She's like a, I think she might, I don't know if she, if she coined Blue Lives Matter, but she wrote the book on it. And yeah. she also wrote an anti-diversity book. Yeah, she, oh, she, her most recent book is Anti-Diversity, D- The Diversity Delusion or something yeah. like the that. The Diversity Delusion, that's wonderful. That's my book on cops. And uh, so here she is talking about um, how that bribery scheme of people probably similarly situated to Tucker <laughs> And probably, for that matter, Heather McDonald, um, what is really at the basis of that? Country, We are paying for these institutions. They're in no sense private. None of them. I think two, Hillsdale and Grove City. Everyone else takes federal funds. So why shouldn't we know? Why do they hide from us how they make these decisions? Well, the main reason is because of the size of racial preferences. That's what they are, don't want anybody to know. Pause the fact- it. Understand what, what the question is here. We give federal funds to these private institutions... Why, why, why is their admissions process not uh, transparent? And we do know there have been multiple lawsuits as to opening up these admissions processes to make sure that they uh, don't provide quotas uh, for affirmative action. Um, and, but yet, everything else is completely opaque, incidentally. Maybe it's just a coincidence that there's probably never been an occasion where someone has donated a million dollars plus to a university where uh, their children did not go there if they had children. I mean, I would be very curious to see that statistic. Like, What percentage of donors to a university who have children who go to college don't get into that school? I would place it somewhere around zero percent. But uh, that's not what they're hiding what are they hiding, folks? Well, she's going to tell you. It's that they're, they're hotbeds of diversity. Well, the main reason is because of the size of racial preferences. That's what they are, don't want anybody to know, the fact that if you're applying to Harvard, being black gets you four, four times greater chance of being admitted than anybody else. This is much greater than legacy preferences. I mean, the... First off, the idea that um, there is concern about that when these people are all, you know, all these institutions are on the record of saying diversity is actually a um, is actually an attribute that we want in our institution, that it actually adds to the educational experience. Um, Aside from the fact that I think this is uh, stated um, directly. Um, the, 
you know, this is the ethnic diversity of the undergraduate students at Harvard University. You have um, Asian white is 40, almost 44 percent, Asian 17 percent, non-resident alien is 12.3 percent, Hispanic Latino is 10.8 percent, black or African American is 6.7 percent. <laughs> Ethnicity unknown is nine point two percent. Like uh, I don't like, legacy uh, students make up around fourteen percent. That's weird, because that would be a number that is higher than. Oh well, I guess she she could be saying like any non whites, right? Any non whites uh, are, are 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 higher than the legacy. That, Tucker, that's Tucker at a certain it's, point, it's just all the same. Right. Well, that's the thing. It's either you know you're either white or you're diverse. Right under her auspices. And so all the non-whites are on one side and the legacies are on another. We it's not to even bring up all the other selective pressures kids go through on their way through high school. Exactly. Well, that's right. I mean, this has always been like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 the, the context of the starting line by which you could even be in a position to slightly benefit in a ultra relative context, you're eliminating 99.999% of the story. Um, that's impressive though, to go on there and, and push that. Super impressive. And characteristic. Well, she manages to shoehorn her thing into anything that happens, so credit Indeed. for that. Indeed. Um, speaking of uh, shoehorning, um, as you know, Donald Trump uh, announced very late relative to European countries. And uh, one would expect when you have, look, American uh, or I should say um, air travel. And um, across the board has become so incredibly advanced and safe in the past 20 or 30 years that it that it's sort of stunning. So when you have an airplane that goes down. And it's a specific airplane that goes down twice in a relatively short period of time relative to the timeline of, of airline uh, crashes. And you have an extended record of pilots reporting, hey, there's something wrong here, <laughs> right? It should be a fairly obvious reaction to grounding the planes. Now, They're of course- just trying to not work. Donald Trump, right. <laughs> Donald Trump, of course, has a deep relationship with uh, Boeing. Uh, they're his favorite. They're big supporters. They give money to the inauguration. All good things. Best planes. Best planes. Uh, and so he uh, did not immediately ground these planes, but later did and made a big show of it that he was going to do it. How does he know that there's something wrong with these planes? Maybe it's the fact that there's been uh, reams written about it. Maybe there's all the reports from the pilots. No, ladies and gentlemen, he gets under the hood. How do we know? Well, Katie Pavlich tells us how. Black boxes, which will give them a ton of information. Flying is still the most, it's the safest way to get around the world, Don't around the country. AOC. Much safer than driving in your car. Pause That's it. For Incidentally, sure. I think Katie Pavlich must know that you cannot drive around the world because of the oceans. But go ahead. For than driving in your car. That's for sure. Um, but there are reports of U.S. pilots complaining or, and reporting problems with this plane that are similar to what happened with these flights that went down. Now, they have to ask the question about standards of training. Are, are the pilots in the United States are getting the same training on the Boeing as the pilots overseas? And that might not be the case. Um, there could be different standards of training that are not being upheld. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But I will say, you know, to give President Trump some credit, everyone's like, oh, what does he know about about planes for uh, the guys owned planes his entire life and he, you know when you own a private plane you know about the way it functions so i think but it was, a little it was bit kind of off my lawn when now, totally this is you know. about as um ridiculous of a take as you possibly could get first off have you owned a plane yeah i have not owned a plane <laughs> well there you so go maybe man. you don't know um i have uh, owned cars for the better part of my life. And if there was something wrong with a specific model of a car, I would have really no more insight into it than anyone else. 
A. B. Because you don't study. I also, um, there is a difference between a private plane and a 737 or whatnot, but even even if there weren't, I mean, the idea. Yeah, I don't know. I went to Wharton. You went to Connecticut I, College. Let's and I got the highest and engines. <laughs> I'm going to take a look under the engine. Uh, just before I come on, I'd like to sit and talk to the pilots about the uh, computer assisted um, uh, navigation tools and uh, the. I have the highest marks at work. A oh, lot better no. service privately. Hey, Mike, Mike Pompeo, you need to call Wart and threaten to drop a drone on them. They release my grades. <laughs> They are very selective about when they think standpoint epistemology is okay. Right? It's unbelievable. These guys are just completely nuts. Got to be um, very selective. With don't, don't you contradict my lived experience. Um, so the Senate, was this yesterday, uh, maybe two days ago, now uh, voted uh, uh, to um, endorse in many respects, it's an endorsement of the War Powers Act. I mean, it is well overdue. Uh, a, um, a resolution to end support for the Saudi-led uh, coalition in Yemen, uh, saying uh, that um, uh, we should not be supporting the slaughter of civilians that is taking place in the context of this so-called civil war. We should not be uh, supporting the embargo, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this will, despite the fact that it was originally a House resolution that the Senate picked up, the, the Republicans managed to um, interfere with it enough uh, procedurally to send it back to the House. I suspect that it's going to pass again in the House. No reason to believe that it will uh, be less this time around. Mike Pompeo, very upset, though, very upset because, uh, well, let's hear Mike Pompeo complain that the U.S. Senate has um, actually acted upon their role under the War Powers uh, Act to um, resolve that we should not be involved in this um, uh, in this uh, Yemen uh, conflict. I'd like to comment on the Senate vote this week to end support for the Saudi-led coalition fighting in Yemen. We all want this conflict to end. We all want to improve the dire humanitarian situation. But the Trump administration fundamentally disagrees that curbing our assistance to the Saudi-led coalition is the way to achieve these goals. The senators who voted aye say they want to end the bombing in Yemen and support human rights. But we really need to think about whose human rights. If you truly care about Yemeni lives, you'd support the Saudi-led effort to prevent Yemen from turning into a puppet state of the corrupt, brutish Islamic Republic of Iran. If we truly care about Saudi lives, you'd want to stop Iran-backed Houthis from launching missiles. Pause it for one second. I mean, just what, what's stunning as you hear this, and for those people who, who, don't, who have not read into this conflict, and you would really have to have really not read into this conflict to know what he's saying, how audacious these lies are. How audacious these lies are. First of all, it is it is a humanitarian crisis what this has caused like the 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 possibility of greater death amongst uh the the yemeni people it's hard to imagine and the idea that this is in any way mitigated it this war is stunning no i mean it's actually li i mean you could translate it as you should have a genocidal campaign and I, we can actually on the border of legitimately use that word if you include like cholera epidemics and food shortages to undermine Iran. But we, that's, isn't that's, that's, that's point two. We that's haven't even gotten two. there. That's, that's, that's point two. Well, no, he's saying so it doesn't become an Islamic Republic. Uh, the point two is the, the idea that Iran is in any really sort of like seriously material way associated with with supporting uh, the uh, the Houthi um, uh, efforts is debunked by any reasonable individual. The Houthis the board. have existed for a very long time, have their own independent uh, power base. And if anything, the relationship between the Iranians and the Houthis is all, has been actually like it is a more true statement today than it was in the beginning of 2015. But they are not Hezbollah at all in terms of depending on Iranians to operate. 
This is just the most uh, disingenuous um, display of supporting the mass murder of 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 people that I think you know we've seen in quite a long time. This is a coalition. I mean, just want to remind people. Do you remember the uh, how a couple of months ago the Saudis bombed a school bus, and it was relevant for a couple reasons? Because one was I think it was a General Dynamics bomb or maybe a Lockheed bomb, and this was the same time they were doing like a, we're supporting girls to go into sciences campaign. Right. And the Saudis, who normally don't publicly comment on their daily murder uh, and slaughter campaign, they came out and they were just like, yeah, that that was a mistake. Because uh, what, what happens is we thought there were two people in the bus that weren't in the bus. So sorry right. about that. Yeah, no, I mean, they basically to... literally were like, you know, the subtext was obvious. Let's listen to... Uh... The rest of this, this, it's disgusting. If we truly care about Saudi lives, you'd want to stop Iran back Houthis from launching missiles into Riyadh. If you truly care about Arab lives in the region, you'd support allied efforts to prevent Iran from extending its authoritarian rule from Tehran to the Mediterranean Sea and on down to Yemen. And if we truly care about American lives and livelihoods and the lives and livelihoods of people all around the world, you'd understand that Iran and its proxies cannot be allowed to control the shipping lanes that abut Yemen. Wow. So, and also sorry, leave sorry the Yemeni alone. children, sorry Yemeni children, shouldn't have uh, had your shipping lanes abutting Iran. You're going to pay for that. All right, the final call of the day, folks. Let's see. Coming from a 215 area code, who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. It's Mindy. How are you guys? Mindy, how are you? We lucked is. out. I'm good. First, I want to just tell you that Donny Deutsch is going to make a run for mayor of New York. No way. Is he? And that's not a fucking joke. That's going to be... How do, now, how do you know that? He said it on Morning Joe this morning. Oh, geez, really? All right, well, welcome to making... the race, you fucking loser. Grand opening. Uh, grand grand opening. Uh, yeah. Thanks for all the content. Uh, exactly. Thanks in and it's also Donnie Deutsch. I'm going to vote for uh, Donald uh, Trump. I mean, honestly, well, I have to say- that was that was Joe saying I just saved your mayoral camp- campaign. That was well, Joe. Joe hasn't been on. He well, Joe, Joe. The reason why I've been watching him lately is Joe and Mika have been um, remotely. If they even show up, they've been just sitting in their living room, just kind of like just showing up. So Willie has basically been running the show. So um, <laughs> Donnie was on today with Willie, and they, they were talking about it, and the, Bill de Blasio was on. And Billy. then after Bill de Blasio, Donnie said that he's going to be thinking about taking a, like they set it up because Willie knew what he was going to do. So they set it up that Willie um, had asked, you know, Donnie about it, and Donnie said that he was thinking about he's – exploring whether or not to run for mayor of New York. So I thought you would like to hear that. And I think that's born out of, you know, he dated Marla Maples. He has this hatred of Trump so much that I think he wants to prove to Trump that he could He's not. He doesn't Run, hate Trump. There's like a personal relationship what? there, Mindy. There, he doesn't hate Donald Trump at all, at least as far well, as I know. he's jealous of him in some sick kind of way right if Donnie Deutsch would like some tips on how to reach out to the emerging constituencies uh, that maybe you'll have trouble reaching but we'll need in a broad based campaign available for a for a million dollar a month Patreon yeah I'll help pledge. him run yeah join yeah Donnie join pay, join TMBS for five hundred thousand dollars a month I'll help you I'll set you up at some meetings <laughs> all right so the other thing I wanted to say is now, I don't want you to yell at me, and this isn't my opinion. I'm just going to tell you what happened. My my Republican girlfriend called me the other day, and we were talking, and she was very excited about Joe Biden running. Mm. And she's a Republican, and her, all her friends are Republican, and they're really excited about Joe Biden. And I know originally we said we didn't give a shit if who they were excited about. And that was originally the way we felt about it. But, you know, if we do get them on board, I know you're going to get mad at me for saying this, but we could, 
I know. Yell at me, please. Yell. Just, just yell. Just obliterate. Just, just, just scream at me. But they, they really, I, they won't Stop vote it. for anybody but like a Kamala or a Biden. That's it. That's 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 like where they begin and end. Okay. And that's a huge amount of people. I mean, a huge amount of people. How, so, how many people exactly? Have you taken a scientific poll of this? Okay, no, but uh, obviously I haven't. But I'm an, uh, you know, approaching 60 white middle class Jewish woman. And half the people I know are Democrats. And the other half are Republicans. No way wealthy. you're approaching 60. You look so young, Mindy. No, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be 60 May 8th. But thank you. It's the hair. I keep the hair long. But um, <laughs> I think that no, knowing knowing, and I haven't had surgery yet, so I think that makes it not look so bad. But the other thing is, these people that I know that are rich that purely vote for Trump because of the tax thing cannot stomach. Did they vote for, uh, for Mitt anybody. Romney? Well, I'm sure. Right. Did they vote for John I'm McCain? I'm sure, but they... Mm, well, I... No, I think they... No, I think she voted for Obama. Okay, but they they vote for Mitt Romney? I didn't ask her about Mitt Romney. All right, well, ask her about Mitt Romney, because, Mindy, here's my, uh, here's, here's my take on this, is that... Um, these people probably voted uh, more often than not for Republican candidates in the past, and the the Democrats have still found ways uh, to win. Now, um, and so I would suggest to you that um, the Democrats uh, can win even if those people don't vote for the candidate, and that, in my experience, um, every time Democrats have tried to pick a candidate based upon the notion that they could win with that candidate, they have lost. Now, we may go back, you know, I'm trying to think. Well, that's of, fair. No, no, don't. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to go back fair. to a time. I that. I'm trying to go back to. Look, an, I want Elizabeth Warren's. I want Elizabeth Warren. No, I, I listen, Iran. put aside, put aside, um, put aside any other calculation. I think it is just like. It is a fool's errand to try and um, uh, vote in a in a primary for someone that you think is going to uh, win an election. I just don't think that our our politics are like that anymore. I think things are a lot more clear. You know, we're not going to nobody's going to get through the Democratic primary who doesn't have at the very least a as good a chance as anybody else as far as we can measure, in my mind. Now, it's possible there is an answer to this question out there, but I don't think it's one that's accessible to us well, as mere mortals. I just, I think that, like, obviously, if we had the ability to run 16 parallel universe elections between the, the different people who are going to be Democratic primary things and run them in the general election, we would come out with a disparity in the victories for the different people. Maybe some would lose. I don't know. But I don't think that we can access that information. We don't have 16 parallel. And I think that every attempt to uh, guess that in the past, whether it was based on polls or not, has been wrong. That's just, you know. No, I, I understand. Yeah, no, I'm glad you cleared that up with me as far as the... Um uh, running, running a candidate to to appease them because we want their votes, and it's not going to work out, and we'll get we'll get screwed even worse. And I understand that. No, I, I am glad you explained that to me. I totally get that, and I'm not interested. I don't even like Beto. I'm like I'm like anti Beto. Well, I, mean, I think I, the, you know, the, my, here's like, here's the thing is that, and this is true in 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 most endeavors. I think just as a as a general principle. When you attempt to win by being defensive, you, you, um, you open yourself up to a, a lot of potential um, of failure points, it seems to me. Um, that you, and you know, I think that's true in sports. I think that's true in, in politics. The, the attempt to win 
uh, by by instead of just actually like just attempting to win, uh, it is like trying to plan to to I don't know to try and guess who's going to win. I think it's Mike just, Tyson said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah, I, infrastructure, gotcha. no bumps well, in the road. I would also point you. I know we can't predict these things, but uh, oh my god. I would also point you to the chart that Michael brought up the other day, uh, which was a poll of the electorate showing that there's not really a constituency for people who are socially liberal and fiscally conservative. I would yeah. say, you know, that there's is a relatively true. small Mindy number. Is, of I them. don't I do think, to be honest, like and I'm not I'm making being just objective here. I like affluent suburban voters are disproportionate because of money and education and geographic location but they are not they do not reflect much of the electorate that's a very small small group of the electorate and we've already seen that mendy right, appreciate so the call we'll have more wait, time to talk thing, about thing. yeah i got one more to say one more yeah i gotta go i did hang up on her when she told me that she hated omar and well, okay. Yeah, yeah. there Hell you go, yeah. Mindy. Get him, oh, Mindy. Him. And on that note, I haven't talked to her since. Bye. Yes. I love it. Bye. Oh, Bye. Mindy, on that Mindy note, is so good. you have a wonderful day, bro, and I'll see you again soon. <laughs> That's a girl. <laughs> All right, folks. That was the final call of the week. We will see you on Monday. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bulb But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know Thanks.